uh, we have uh, the pleasure to have wonderful speakers in this session. And actually this uh, uh, session is the traditional for Marcel Grossman. All the week uh, there was discussion of the current achievements, current results. And uh, this day is dedicated to the future. So this morning we had uh, great talks uh, by uh, mostly our uh, Chinese and Japanese colleagues. And uh, now we follow with the European and hopefully American speakers. So the first speaker of today is Margarita Hernandez, who will uh, talk about the enhanced X-ray timing and polarimetry mission EXTP. So uh, Margarita, you may start, Morning. please. Okay. You have 30 minutes and then I will warn you uh, five minutes before the end of the time. Okay. Okay. You see my screen? Yes. yes. Please go. Okay. I think this, this morning uh, there was already partially uh, mentioned because since it's a Chinese European mission, it was already mentioned in the first session by Xuan Nanzan, which is the PI of this uh, project. So XTP is a future space mission aimed to explore uh, the fundamental physics laws of the universe. It's a flagship ray observatory being developed by the Chinese Academy of Sciences with a large contribution of Europe. It's now in phase B. The launch is planned in 2027. The mission lifetime is five years with a goal of eight years. And it will be an observatory open to the worldwide scientific community. The observing plan is based in a core program, program plus a guest investigator program. So let me just uh, mention the prospective study made by ESA, which is called the Cosmic Vision uh, from the period 2015-2025 where ISA addressed um, main quest questions of, uh, uh, four questions of research across Europe and worldwide concerning the universe on our place in it. And one of them was, what are the fundamental physical laws of the universe? Uh, this uh, one say subsection of that was to study the matter under extreme conditions to prove gravity theory in the very strong film environment and black holes and other compact objects and also the state of matter of supranuclear energies in neutron stars. So, I mean, so uh, this means to study compact objects, so like uh, compact stars, or so like black holes and neutron stars, as they are excellent labs for fundamental physics. Why? Because there we find the strongest densities and gravitational fields and magnetic fields, uh, more stronger than those that we can uh, test in the terrestrial labs. Uh, so the science driver of XTP are, so the core science say are these three market here. So dense matter. So the goal is to constrain the equation state of, of the dense matter. So the matter that made, which neutron stars have made, accretion in strong gravity. So the test of general relativity in black holes and, and also neutron stars, and also strong magnetism. So light and matter in ultra strong magnetic fields. In addition, it will be an observatory and it's ray observatory. So it will monitor uh, transient sources, including also very important the electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves for rapid follow-up. So it also it's important for multi-messenger astronomy. So uh, why one can do that? In fact, it has been advanced already saying that it's an X-ray emission, but why? Because as you surely know, the X-ray emission uh, is, there is an X-ray emission when material falls in strong uh, gravitational fields of compact stars. And so if we are able to make observations, X-ray observations with high time resolution. This will be a unique tool to investigate strong field gravity and the equation state of ultra dense matter in neutron stars. So just a, a nice say, slide that I will explain later in more detail, which is the uh, showing the instruments that will be on board the future XTP uh, satellite. Well, this is another, spacecraft configuration, but different than the one in the header cover page, but because there, have, there, is still, there are still different possibilities. So there will be this coverage of the XI energy range from 0.5 kV to 50 kV with four different instruments. And I will explain later the details as I said. So the two say Europe led instruments are the LID and the wave field monitor and the SFA and PFA are led by China. 
the PIs of the European instruments, since we are talking mainly of the European part today, it's uh, Marco Ferracci from Italy and myself from Spain. So just I would like to mention that there was a parallel session in this Marcel Grossman uh, meeting in um, on Wednesday, uh, moderated by Fanjun Lu, who is the project manager of XTP and Marco Ferracci, uh, principal investigator of the LID. And there were very nice talks that I think they will be also available on YouTube. And I just mark some of them because I will mention them and use what was presented that there about the science mainly. So let's start with the dense matter. So the question of state of neutron stars. So I take this uh, presentation from Anna Watts in the Marcel Grossman. So, and this has been already, of course, published. So moment that I see here. Well, anyway, so um, if we want to study matter, you, you know, this famous temperature uh, density diagram. So with the heavy ion uh, colliders, and so experiments on ground, we can study, say, this uh, zone of high temperature, low density, but the region of low temperature and high density is not accessible in uh, terrestrial life. So the only way, say, to advance in the knowledge of the strong force that is relevant, of course, for uh, the understanding the nuclei in the, in the universe is to study the neutron stars. So the strong force, of course, will determine the stiffness of the neutron star matter, and this is encoded in the, so the pressure equation of state, okay? And I don't can see that now. Uh, so, and this is uh, uh, reflected, is directly related to the mass radio relation. So what we need to do is to measure with high accuracy a few percent level, the masses and radius of neutron stars. And then through this representation, we would see uh, which is the equation of state. So these are the theoretical ones and we should put here the results of observations. So just to mention one of the uh, ways to do that, this was explained by Anna Watts in her presentation and it's also published. Uh, so, uh, for instance, in, we have a neutron star that is experimenting uh, on uh, what is called a thermonuclear X-ray bore, so nuclear burning on, on, on its top. Then uh, there will be, say, hot spots there. If they are offset, so they are not in the wall of the neutron star, then, and since the neutron stars, we know they are rotating and very fast, <laughs> there will be an X-ray pulsation related to this rotation. Then this is, the say, the basis of the phenomenon. And also there is the propagation of light. So we should observe the light that comes from this uh, burst, say. And then uh, there are several relativistic eff effects there related to the gravity, which so in fact related to the mass radius, okay? So weak gravity is different than strong gravity. For instance, here you can see that the poles here, the variation in brightness with time never goes to zero because of light bending. And in the case of weak gravity, we have a zero here when this, rotates, okay, and we don't see this hotspot. So this is just to say that there is, in the mass radius can be, uh, is also that the pulse profile will give us the uh, counts, so the number of photons versus energy uh, as a function of phase, okay, for each phase of rotation. So we will see, we can have this, say, 3D, uh, graph. The modeling will give the em emission and also take into account, of course, the propagation of light. So it will take into account all the relativistic effects. And then, of course, one knows, this is an example of NICER, an instrument that is on board the International Space Station. We know, we should know the properties of the instrument. So putting all together, finally, we can derive the mass radius. And from the mass radius, so this is what is measured, relation, we can derive the question of state. So of course there are several complications, different methods, but this is the main idea explained by Anna Watts. Well, so this has been already done with the NICER instrument on board the International Space Station, and there are these results already published, uh, which already start to constrain a bit the equation of state. What will uh, XTP do? Well, XTP will allow to do that with more sources, with different types of sources, because this there are different types of accreton neutron stars and different phenomena that occur there. 
that can allow us to do this pulse profile model. Then this is just a scheme also shown by Anna in this Marcel Grossman parallel session. We see that current status will be that, and then with XTP we could constrain much better. So these, all the details are in different papers, but in particular in the white paper related to dense matter, one of the core science topics of XTP, as I mentioned at the beginning, published in Science China, Physics, Mechanical and Astronomy at the beginning of 2019. So, uh, just to mention that the, uh, repeat a bit, that the, the interesting thing of XTP, as compared, for instance, to the current instrument uh, nicer on board the International Space Station, is that it can uh, provide multiple complementary diagnostics because it has also a, the possibility of to do polarimetry. So, the combination of large effective area and polarimetry can uh, allow to do cross-checking, so different methods apply to a single object, and also to study different types of objects where you can do this pulse profile modeling. And there are also other techniques, okay? So the impact is not only in fundamental physics, but also, of course, in astrophysics, in the sense that it's crucial to understand, uh, to understand other properties of the neutron stars and to uh, the relation with core collapse supernovae, black hole formation, and also, of course, on the mergers of neutron stars that, as we know, are sources of gamma ray bursts and sources of gravitational waves. Well, uh, second topic, say, strong field gravity. So I borrow it from the uh, loft, which was a, a study already uh, of a, a mission, a study that made for ESA. So, uh, proposal for the M3 call of ESA in, this, in the framework of this cosmic vision that was not that was accepted for feasibility study, but after was a mission for observing exoplanets was approved, which is Plato. But then for the yellow book there, the, this sentence I think is very illustrative. So the strong field gravity that one can study with uh, XTP or loft at the epoch or now with XTP. Uh, is to study stationary, it corresponds to stationary space times, not to, not to dynamic space times, which we, we, what will be studied and is being studied already by gravitational wave uh, detectors like LIGO, Virgo, the future LISA. Uh, but we'll uh, study station, uh, in, in the case of uh, XTP, it will be stationary space time. Just to mention here that three uh, cases, so accreting uh, Newton stars, accreting black holes, mass black holes, this will be strong space-time curvature here, and in the case of AGN, so active galactic nuclei, where we have a uh, huge uh, mass, uh, uh, black holes with uh, enormous mass, then it will be the uh, weak space-time curvature. So the, we can study, uh, say, the uh, gravity in the spanning 16 orders of uh, uh, magnitude, say, in the space-time curvature. So just to show, but there is a lot of details and I cannot explain all in, because uh, we don't have time, of course, but just to explain a uh, black hole here, uh, creating matter, we have the, the disk, we have the corona, and there are different types of emission here that are explained in this slide from Alessandra de Rosa. Then it's possible to study through this uh, spectral timing uh, together with polarimetry, uh, relativistic rather this reflection, continuum fitting, quasi periodic oscillation. So you can study different components in the spectrum. You can also study the variation of this. And uh, with that, one can obtain, uh, for instance, masses and spins of the black holes, but also other uh, interesting properties. So XTP will offer for the first time the most complete diagnostic of compact sources thanks to the excellent spectral timing and polarimeter sensitivity on a single payload. So all uh, the instruments point to the same source, say. Well, this is explained in this paper uh, in the same series of invited reviews, namely Science China. Okay, and finally, uh, finally regarding the core science, we have the strong magnetism. So physics and astrophysics of strong magnetic field systems with XCP. This is the cover page of the corresponding paper. So here, just to mention that there is a quantum electrodynamic prediction uh, from 80 years ago, Heisenberg and others, that has not been demonstrated until very early, three years ago or so, or less. And that can will be confirmed again, say, and done almost routinely with thanks to the existence of huge um, uh, the magnetars, so neutron stars that have enormous magnetic fields. So the thing is that uh, uh, the propagation of light 
can be modified by the magnetic field. So it will be the interaction of light with itself. So this is a very small effect, depends on the magnetic field in intensity. So it's very it's hard to measure on Earth. But this effect is, uh, will, is can be substantial in the vacuum near highly magnetized neutron stars or magnetars. Okay, so then this will be an example just so you see the, the flux uh, of the light you receive from a magnetar here, uh, and you don't see the effects of uh, any effect of. So you, you make the model, you compare with observations, and having the uh, this effect uh, considered or not, you don't see a difference. So there are two curves here that are almost identical. But if you have you look at the polarization, so just looking at the flux without being able to study the polarization, you cannot see anything. But if you can study the degree of polarization, and you can see the difference. And then this is a simulation, okay, for uh, a source, a particular source, a magnet of this one, okay, with a certain time of simulations. There are others in the paper about this with shorter <coughs> observation times, also 100 kiloseconds. <coughs> So the thing is that these QED effects are only visible if you are able to study the polarization of your sources, to observe the effect of polarization. Okay, well, so XP and XDP uh, will do, be able to do that in several bright magnetars. Well, this is, so let's now move to the final part, which will be the observatory science. This is not the core science, but of course having a, a, a monitor as we will show in a moment. Uh, that observes the uh, 25% of the sky instantaneously, uh, all, always, so you can do a lot of science. So it will be a discover machine. This is again a presentation in this Marcel Grossman meeting. So different types of objects. So just I show it here one, but I will go faster because if not just to show an example here, I know because I work with on that. So just to compare with a previous mission, RxD. So you have here a variation in a nova explosion that can be a precursor of a type one supernova and that also can accelerate particles. This has been demonstrated theoretically and also observationally through Fermilab that has discovered high energy emission related to particle acceleration uh, coming from Novi, as is say normal for supernovae, but not so normal for Novi. Just to mention that here, this is what could be done in 2006, okay? So more than 10 years ago already. And this is what could uh, the lab combined, the, one of the instruments, the LID combined with the SFA, SFA and other of the instruments of XTP could be, you can see that the quality is really uh, uh, remarkable. The difference is very great. So let's go again to the, uh, let's now go to the instrument part. So we said that we need to study the X-ray emission. So this is just a comparison of what has been able up to now or regarding effective area versus energy. We have here the AstroSat, now the Indian satellite that has this 6,000 square centimeters, this nicer that I showed before in the space station, XMM Newton. So we have this order of this at most uh, areas, effective areas that are related to sensitivity. So the idea is that to go forward, a uh, new idea of detector should be included. And then these are the SDD detectors that are very good to uh, optimize the timing performance. They avoid pile up. Okay, which means that when you are detecting a photon, you are already receiving another. So for very intense sources, it's very important to avoid this pile up because if not, you are not able to, to know the energy of your photons. Well, so in again, in one of these uh, in this, in, in, there is a paper related to the explanation of the payload of the mission of XCP, and then I come back to this figure. So we have these uh, instruments, so the four instruments. So the, uh, there are three narrow field of view instruments, uh, so pointed instruments, which are these ones covering, you see, from 0.5 to 30 kV, and there is a wide field of view instrument. So the, the here is just a scheme borrowed from Yubeng, Chu from China of the scheme. So we have optics here. So uh, focusing telescopes for these two instruments, the SFA and PFA, okay? And here we have a collimator for the large array detector. And here we have a coded mask instrument for the wide field 
instruments. So just, uh, what time is it? Okay. So just to show the different instruments, but just pay attention to what is indicated. So say in red, so the SFA soft response is what is important because combined with the LID that we will show in a moment, uh, they cover a broad energy range. Okay. And this is of course with mirrors. So it has a five uh, meters focal length. That's the reason to have this tube here. So uh, the PFA has the possibility, thanks to the so-called gas pixel detectors that in fact are made in Italy and that are now since a long time ago, but they are not being flown. They will be flown in the XP NASA uh, Europe um, mission next year soon. So this allows to study polarization. And then the la LID, large area detector. So it has a, see here, three square meters. We were talking about uh, hundreds, at most 1,000 square centimeters before. So this will be a, a big step forward. So if, uh, at the 8 kV, which is the center of the energy range important. And a very, very good uh, timing resolution. So better than 10 microseconds. Okay, and combine it with uh, moderate to good energy resolution. And then the wide field monitor, which is essential to just tell the other three instruments that point in the same direction. So it will tell when there is an outburst in one of these neutron stars or black holes, and then the whole satellite will move, and with these three instruments together with the wide field monitor, will look in detail. So in this case, what is important here is the field of view. And also the detectors are the same uh, with more uh, better spatial resolution to do imaging, but uh, are the same as, as those for the LID. So they also avoid this pile up, so they can do a lot of science as well. So this is the combination. And then this here is the uh, performance in context. So as, this is the LID, this is the SFA, so both an XTP, compared to Athena, AstroSat, so the current missions and future missions. So the idea here is that XTP, P will focus on the tail studies of bright phenomena, okay? The brightest black holes and neutron stars with excellent timing and polarimetric capability. This is a big thing. Athena, as you probably know, is a future mission from ESA for the 30s, uh, is more focused on fainter sources and excellent spectral resolution. So they are complementary, they are not, say, competing to each other. It's completely different, say, what can be done with one and the other. So the wide field monitor, as here is a the simultaneous field of view, so an instantaneous field of view of the wide field monitor compared to other instruments. Swift back, probably you know, the one that is detecting a lot of gamma ray burst, short gamma ray burst, and also several other sources. Maxi, on board of the space station, and RXT, the one, a short one, the first uh, good timing instruments from NASA. Well, okay, so you see that the field of view of uh, the wide field monitor is much larger. It covers 25% of the sky instantaneously. And uh, the 50% of the sky is accessible at any time by the other, the, the narrow field of view instruments. Okay. So the main, I will now concentrate on the wide field monitor for the five minutes I have. Uh, so the main uh, goal, say, of the wide field monitor is to provide the triggers for the target of opportunity observations of the narrow field of view instruments, LID, SFA, PFA, which are the ones that will provide, say, the core science. So it should, uh, and there is a fast, thanks to the design of the satellite reaction time to point to these sources. So to do that, of course, the field of view should be as wide as possible, as I have just shown that it will be the case. So another important, uh, goal of the wide field monitor is that it will uh, provide uh, alerts for gamma ray burst, okay, for any other type, say, of uh, ray burst. So, of course, it will do its monitoring with quite good spectral resolution, as we said, similar to the one of the LID, all the time, with a, a huge part of the sky. But whenever it detects an interesting object, all the, the satellite will point there to do the core science. And also there will be the, this, and this will be explained later, I imagine Jean-Luc uh, when talking about SWOM. So in the SWOM heritage, there is this system, but also there is the Beidou system, which is the GPS from China. Uh, so a system to alert uh, on the ground stations, okay. 
these are not ground stations to, to which you download data or upload data, but just you tell that there has been a gamma ray burst or a gravitational wave event, and then other instruments are again on ground or whatever instruments you have, you know, so other satellites can observe in detail these objects. So this is an extra, uh, a la swamp, say, that uh, the so-called X-bot, version trigger on the Inboro XTP that will be able on the wide field monitor. And then just I can go far just to mention that the wide field monitor is a coded mass instrument. Okay, then it works by the camera pairs. And here on the, I take again the more recent configuration of the spacecraft, this one. So there will be the cameras pointing this, this is on shade, this is the LID, these models here of SDD detectors, these are the, the, the optics, and on the bottom there are the corresponding detectors. Here, as I said, the LID, and here the wide field monitor. Then you see that with this uh, configuration, it covers a uh, huge part of the sky. The orbit will be a low equatorial orbit, so like the one of the space station, for instance, or low inclination. This is important for the uh, background to minimize the damage of the detectors. This is the consortium, the Chinese institutes participating and the uh, institutes in Europe participating. You see that there is a broad participation in uh, Europe. And so then as a summary, let's say that XTP offers a unique combination of instruments in the X-ray energy range. Why? Because it covers a broad energy range. It has high spectral resolution and outstanding timing resolution. It has polarimetric capability and a huge collecting area. It is optimized to study, which was our goal, as we said at the beginning, matter under the most extreme conditions of density, gravity, and also magnetism. And the science area, it addresses as a summary of the fundamental physics topics. I hope, I hope I have convinced you, even that explains quite far. So, uh, equation of state of ultra dense matter and strong field gravity and uh, strong magnetism. And also, of course, this uh, a lot of astrophysics, purely say astrophysics topics, mainly related to compact stars, neutron stars, and black holes, especially when there is mass accretion onto them. So, of course, it's a time domain astrophysics uh, instrument because it will survey, survey the dynamic X-ray sky with large duty cycle. And also it provides uh, a window, um, possibility to do multi-wavelength, multi-message astrophysics, especially related to this uh, burst alert system that it will be do in the heritage of the SWAM mission. <laughs> this will be the next talk, I think. Okay, then I can finish here. So just remind that there are these white papers that I already mentioned one by one regarding the core science here, the observatory science and the payload on the mission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margarita, for this very nice presentation, complimentary to Professor Zhang's uh, talk of this morning. And uh, uh, well, the questions, uh, please, you can either raise your hand or uh, uh, post your question in the question uh, in this session, and we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. you know, we'll be happy to answer. While we're waiting for question, maybe I can ask one. Uh, you are talking about uh, well. First of all, of course, it's, it's great to have this mission as as uh, every new X-ray telescope. It, it should bring some new discoveries, certainly, especially in the transient uh, transient sources. Uh, but um, you were mentioning a very large collecting area, and uh, at the same time, uh, sensitivity to the brightest sources. How, how, so how does this uh, fit uh, this uh, uh, large, actually, uh, with large collecting area, you could uh, actually detect uh, faint sources, isn't it? As, uh, can you repeat the last sentence? Yes, you were mentioning the, the telescope will have a large collecting area, very large. Uh -huh. and, uh, that the mission is targeted to the brightest sources. So uh, actually with a very large collecting area, you can also detect faint sources. Why this? Uh, ah, okay. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Ah, well, okay, yes. This was just to um, compare with Athena, uh, since it's, oh. uh, say, the other big mission no? in Europe, in this case, from ESA, that is in the... <laughs> 
for coming years, well, for 2030 something, uh, no, because uh, with Athena you can go to say AGNs in very far away galaxies, so you are really searching to discover new uh, faint sources. It, it's not that we cannot observe faint sources, but it's that just to emphasize that we are not looking for the faintest sources with the uh, best spectral resolution to see this iron line. In fact, the iron line appeared in one of my slides there. It's very important at 6 kV on um, at zero redshift, but that is redshifted so to 4 kV or so lower energies. So this is not our uh, objective to see this iron line with an excellent spectral resolution for the faintest sources. It was just to emphasize that it's not that we are not interested in faint sources. But already some of the sources are known, say. Others will be new, a lot of new sources, but some of the, these transients are known and then when they will have an eruption, we can observe them as. So some are known and are not so faint. It was just this, perhaps it was a bit misleading. I, I see your point. <laughs> I see, I see. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Aditya Tamar. Please ask your question. Um, so the question is regarding whether uh, M87 and SAG star are considered to be source targets for the EXTP. Can you repeat? I don't hear well. <laughs> um, are uh, M87 or Sagittarius A star considered to be source targets for the EXTP? Ah, Sagittarius A. Well, it, it can be, but I, um, I think it's not one of the most uh, interesting for EXTP. But of course, it will be observable, yes. I'm not sure now. There is a list of, of the sources, but yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank our speaker again. And, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And we can move to the next speaker, who is uh, Jean-Luc Artelia will present uh, uh, his talk about the SWOM mission. So please, you may start to look. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gregory. Can you hear me and see my slides? Yes. OK. So as mentioned by Margarita, I will say a few words of the SWOM mission. Of course, this is not uh, just myself, this is uh, on behalf of the entire Zvon collaboration, uh, which is a, a, large, uh, a large collaboration, which includes many institutes in China, as you can see here, and in France, and also a European Institute in the uh, UK and Germany, and uh, the UNAM in Mexico. So, uh, why I will first show quickly uh, le, the, the spacecraft here, uh, the, the anti-mission, and then I will try to go to some specifics of uh, SVOM and explain you why, uh, uh, why we believe this mission is interesting and why we believe it is interesting to have uh, just another one uh, gamma reverse mission. So here you, you see uh, the scheme of the, the satellite uh, with four instruments. So there are two wide field instruments, the gamma ray monitor here with three modules here, here, and here. The wide field camera eclairs here, which is provided by France. The GRM is provided by China. And two narrow field instruments, one provided by China, which is a visible telescope, and one provided by France, which is a, which is a micropore X-ray telescope. So I will go further into the description of this, uh, this instrument, so I will not uh, stay too long on them now. And then uh, along with the satellite, uh, this is something we have learned from previous mission, we'll have a ground uh, segment with uh, two, uh, say, mid-sized telescope, 1.2 uh, meters for the Chinese one and 1.3 meter for the French one, which will be installed in, in, uh, 
Baja California in Mexico, and then uh, a set of wide angle cameras that will monitor the visible sky, uh, more or less at the same time uh, and in the same uh, uh, region of the sky uh, as uh, will be the satellite we will will do it. Uh, and of course, if you have ground satellite and the ground segment, you need to have communication. So I will explain how the satellite communicates with the ground and also how the uh, ground uh, communicates with the satellite. So let's uh, start first with a few words about science and specifically the question, uh, uh, why another GRB mission? We, we have a, a very successful mission like SWIFT, uh, especially, and also Fermi and Integral and, uh, and other missions. So why do you want to have another one? Uh, the point is that with high energy astrophysics, you address uh, uh, major questions in astrophysics. So questions, so I will just go through this list very quickly, but uh, stellar explosions, uh, relativistic jets, in uh, GRBs, AGN, and there are many uh, open questions about these jets. So we, we really want to explore them in, in more detail. The physics of accretion and the ejection around compact objects, the origin of magnetar activity, the role of jets in uh, uh, the production of a very high energy or uh, ultra high energy cosmic, ray, uh, cosmic rays, the use, possible use of a gamma ray burst for cosmography and knowing the, the, the geometry of the universe, testing Lorentz invariance, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many, uh, these are questions which are uh, uh, fundamental physical questions. And then there are questions connected with, which I would call more astrophysics, uh, the connection between GRB and supernova, why only some kind of supernova produce GRB, what, is, what are the conditions for the production of GRB, the origin of ultra long gamma ray burst, uh, the, there is now a completely new uh, uh, side of the universe uh, which we are exploring, which is a black hole uh, life and uh, evolution. So we need to learn more uh, uh, about this or these objects, their place in the universe, their role, and so on. And so you can do that. Uh, uh, high energy astrophysics can uh, help to do that. And uh, of course, where are the binary neutron star majors? What, what are the hosts? The, you can explore the intergalactic medium at very high redshift with high Z GRB, and uh, maybe population three stars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are a number of questions which are open and which is not decreasing with time. So uh, new missions open new questions, and this is something. Uh, that uh, you realize when you work in this field. And so you, 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 we need more missions. Uh, this was for high energy astrophysics, but we have also now multi-messenger astrophysics uh, with the detection of gravitational waves and uh, the discovery of binary neutron star mergers. So the origin of uh, connected uh, closely to the origin of heavy elements. And again, we want to, to understand uh, Black neutron star plus binary neutron star evolution plus black hole and neutron star binaries, which is something which is very new, which have been discovered recently by uh, the LIGO Virgo Kagura collaboration, the physics of merger, etc., etc., binary black hole demography and merger rates, uh, black hole masses. What are the masses of black holes in GRBs, which is something which is uh, for me completely. Uh, uh, not uh, addressed now. And uh, is there electromagnetic emission from binary black miniatures, et cetera. So in, in all this, there are a, a full uh, set of questions which are relevant to this kind of mission. Now, uh, this kind of mission, they can be addressed with various uh, sources, various objects, so gamma ray burst of all types, long, short, ultra long, uh, X-ray flashes, etc. With mergers of compact objects, which may be or not connected with gamma ray burst, soft gamma ray repeaters, 
uh, relativistic tidal disruption events, active galactic nuclei, galactic transients, and from a different uh, perspective, maybe terrestrial gamma ray flashes and fast radio bursts can also bring some clues about the, the, this phenomena. Uh, uh, another reason why we, we believe it is still interesting to have a gamma ray burst mission and a mission to study the transient uh, high energy sky is that is the astrophysical environment. So in the 2020s, uh, we will have many, uh, we will, there will be many very powerful uh, other uh, facilities on the ground or in space, which will permit to study uh, high energy sources and transient sources with much more detail. So I have given a list here, but which is uh, of course non-exhaustive. Uh, so uh, very high energy facilities, uh, many, many satellites to study the transient sky, uh, erosy tiny X-rays, gravitational waves, neutrinos, uh, very important uh, survey telescope in the visible and in radio. So this will permit to place the observation of high energy satellite in context. And so it is very important to continue to observe and detect new uh, high energy transients. Uh, however, this very rich panorama uh, requires uh, improved coordination between instruments because you may uh, want to look at the same uh, time in the same direction or perform follow-up with large facilities and so on. So you need to coordinate the instrument. And you also need more flexibility in the observing strategy because the TO, the, the alerts, they can come from everywhere and you may want to observe them with your instrument. So uh, this makes everything more complex. Uh, and also, I think that high energy missions must be designed to take into account the diversity of high energy sources, in diversity in terms of energy, time scale, variability, etc. And some events are rare or faint. Uh, so they are difficult to, to, to catch. Uh, for instance, we had one binary neutron star merger with electromagnetic counterpart in uh, 97, and we have not observed another one since then, so it's not uh, easy science. And uh, also this calls for long mission because uh, if you have a uh, two years mission, then you may miss the most interesting events. And uh, in, the, in that sense, missions like SWIFT, Integral and so on, which are very long uh, lifetime are very important. So let's go now to uh, the SVOM mission. So you have already seen this picture. So I will, uh, before this, uh, going into some detail for the instrument, I, I will go through the, uh, the specific, some specific features of uh, SVOM. So uh, we have prompt multi-wavelength coverage with three instruments simultaneously. So two onboard instruments, Eclair, in the four to 150 kV range and a GRM above 15 kV up to a few MEVs. So we will have a very good coverage of the prompt emission. And at the same time, we have GWAC on the ground, which covers part of the field of view of Eclair. So in, in maybe 20%, 25% of the cases, we will have uh, visible plus uh, KV plus MEV uh, coverage of the prompt emission, which is something with good time resolution, which is something which is very important to understand the physics of the, the jet. Then uh, we have a, a similar situation with the afterglow, uh, the, the multi-wavelength coverage of the afterglow in X-rays and SWIFT has shown the, the importance of this energy range, the, the X-ray energy range plus the visible telescope and the ground follower telescope on the ground. So we will have here again, a good, uh, very, very good uh, uh, energy coverage of the afterglow. Uh, we will provide localization in less than 30 seconds. We have good sensitivity balance 
between the VT and MXT for at least for GLBs, uh, which means that uh, we believe that 70% of the GLBs will be detected by both VT and MXT, which is not the same 70 or 80%. It's not the same as SWIFT where 95% of the GRBs are detected by the XRT and uh, maybe 30% of them by UVOT or something like that, maybe a bit more. But there, there is an imbalance here, so it's difficult to, to, to have multi wavelength uh, observations. Here, we, we have a less sensitive uh, X-ray telescope and the more sensitive visible telescope. And so we, we will have a comparable uh, sensitivity for gamma ray blast. Then, uh, due to the good sensitivity of the visible telescope, which can go down to magnitude 22.5 in uh, five minutes, or, uh, and five minutes after the GRB, so we will be able to identify very quickly dark GRBs, and so which are potentially at very high redshift and uh, requesting uh, more uh, deeper observation of, the, of these events. And then we have a good coverage of the prompt afterglow transition, uh, both in uh, visible uh, with the GFT and the VT, and uh, in X rays with Eclair and MXT, which have some uh, uh, common energy coverage. Uh, we, we also in the, uh, made a lot of efforts to have a low energy threshold, so this is not the 2 kb of the XTP or 82, but this is 4 kV. And this, this is important, we believe, to study soft uh, gamma ray bursts like X ray flashes and very high uh, uh, redshift uh, gamma ray bursts, which are one, one key uh, topic of the mission. And uh, another point which I would like to insist on is that all eclairs and GRM photons are sent to the ground. So we can do much more de detailed analysis and we can have some delayed trigger, of course, with a delay of a few hours for events which, can, which are maybe very long or um, with a very, or during specific period where the onboard trigger is not uh, working with uh, uh, fully, maybe during slew, for instance, or something like that. So this is something which uh, which is very important, and uh, we expect to to gain uh, maybe uh, twenty percent more uh, more burst uh, from ground analysis, which are uh, maybe which could be different from what we observe from space. So I will illustrate now two, two points here, the probe multi-wavelength coverage uh, with Eclair and GRM and the impact of uh, the low energy of Eclair with two examples. And then I will go back to the, to, to the pointing strategy and other mission uh, features. So here you have a study which has been done uh, a few years ago by uh, Maria Grazia Bernardini showing the importance of having Eclair and GRM, so the, you have the energy bands here, to detect uh, maybe black body components or photospheric, more general uh, sense, photospheric components. So to disentangle uh, uh, the many contribution uh, that contri uh, of the prompt emission, so the photospheric emission, the internal shock, or the dissipation processes. So we expect to be able to get a better understanding of this uh, phase with the observation thanks to the combination of these two instruments. And uh, of course, uh, uh, for some gamma ray bursts, we will, this information will be extended to the visible with GWAC and also uh, to very high energies with Fermilat or uh, CTA, for instance. So we hope to have uh, really a new diagnostic for some gamma ray bursts of the prompt emission. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, something which may be also interesting is the nature of uh, supernova less GRBs. Uh, for instance, this GRB uh, showed absolutely no supernova, while it was very nearby, and it is. We, we have made a study here of nearby GRBs. This is the work of our Seattle uh, of nearby uh, GRBs. Uh, 
as seen by Eclair. So you see here, this is the detection threshold of Eclair. Here is the distance of the GRB mentioned on the top with the redshift and in the bottom with the co-moving volume. And here you have the signal to noise ratio and you see the, uh, at different distances, how the evolution of the signal to noise ratio. And you see that for instance, this event uh, is visible to, to large volume. So we may uh, expect detect some of the, some events like that. And the part, the peculiarity of this event is that it was a gamma ray burst with very nearby a long gamma ray burst and with no supernova. And if you have an event like that, uh, when uh, gamma uh, gravitational wave interferometer are operating, you will be uh, you will know if it is a merger kind of gamma ray burst or a core collapse kind of gamma ray burst. So we have really with the combination, we know that of course with short gamma ray burst, but the combination of high energy uh, instrument plus gravitational wave uh, interferometers offers a, re a new diagnostic of these events and especially for long gamma ray burst with no supernova. Uh, let me continue. No, now I go, so this was more connected to the instrument. Now I will go to the mission uh, strategy. So the pointing strategy, the alerts, uh, the distribution of alerts and the TOO program. So the pointing strategy, uh, we have decided to <coughs> not optimize the total numbers, number of bursts detected by the, by the mission, uh, but uh, the number of uh, births that can be followed, uh, followed from the ground. So this is a choice. So for this reason, we are looking in the, mostly in the anti-solar direction. I will show you a picture uh, in the next slide. And then when we swap detect a burst, it will be immediately observable by uh, large telescopes on the ground because the burst will be on the night over the night hemisphere of the Earth. Uh, the problem of that is that we have the Earth in the field of view during part of the, uh, during part of the orbit. You, you have a, a sketch here. So you see we are pointing in the anti-solar direction, so this direction. So when we detect a burst here, it will be over the night hemisphere of the Earth. And here we have the Earth in the field of view. Um, so the advantage of that is uh, that we expect a large fraction of GRB with the redshift uh, between 50 and 17%, while this fraction is about 30% for, uh, for SWIFT. So we will have a more uh, complete overview of the intrinsic properties of GRBs. And this is very important for relations like, uh, for instance, the Amati relation and so on. So it will be uh, very important, I think, to have uh, the redshift of a larger fraction of a gamma ray burst. And then uh, we will also have long exposure uh, in the same direction. We will point a few days in the same direction. And this will uh, facilitate the detection of long transients. Then uh, we will distribute fast alerts like SWIFT, uh, not with the same, uh, not with the same mechanism because uh, uh, they use TDRSS and uh, of course, which cannot be used by Chinese satellites. So we, we have developed uh, a network, worldwide network of VHF antenna, a la Haiti 2, like uh, that was done on Haiti 2. And this one will be used also by EXTP, as mentioned by Margarita. And then uh, we also have a strong TO program because SWIFT demonstrated the, the importance of uh, being able to point the satellite to a specific direction when there is an interesting source on short notice. And so, uh, let me let me explain that now. So here I have already mentioned the, uh, the, the pointing strategy. So the, uh, this has some uh, consequence in terms of sky coverage. And you have here in 
galactic coordinate, the sky coverage of, uh, of Eclair in this case. And what you see is that we are avoiding the galactic plane because this is, uh, as demonstrated by integral, for instance, this is not the best uh, pointing uh, to, to detect gamma ray bursts. And on the other hand, we will have a long, uh, long exposures uh, towards the Virgo, uh, the Virgo cluster of galaxies. So this is something that we have started to, to, to think what we can do with this uh, pointing strategy. Uh, if we, we have made specific studies, so you have seen this study uh, here of uh, nearby uh, GRBs, but we have also uh, a study by Dagono et al. about ultra long uh, GRBs and what SVOM can do. And here you see a plot showing for a set of ultra long GRB detected by SWIFT the uh, maximum distance, uh, redshift, at which they can be detected. So you have here the probability of detection as a function of redshift. And some of them, they are detect we can detect them to high redshift. And so we expect to be able uh, to provide uh, crucial information on, this, uh, on these events, especially because uh, for each detected uh, ultra long GRB, we will be able to perform multi wavelength uh, study. Here, I go quickly through the VHF network. So, you see here the planned VHF network. Each uh, round here is a VHF station. So, we have started already collaboration with many institutes to install uh, VHF antennas, receiving antennas at a crucial uh, point on the Earth, and we hope this, uh, uh, this network to be used beyond the SCOM. And then uh, we, what we have, uh, with, we have demonstrated that with simulations that with this network, we will be able to receive 65% uh, of the alert within 30 seconds uh, on the ground. And for 90% of the alert, it will be maybe uh, few minutes, something like that. And so you see here, the, in green, all the VHF stations which are already installed. So you have here a nice picture showing some of them around the world. And uh, this is an ongoing effort. So I uh, continue with the core program, the, we, with the observing program. So we have three observing programs. The core program, which is uh, the getting a GRB sample. So this is uh, the, the task of the satellite. So de GRB detection, automatic repointing in a few minutes to, towards the GRB and uh, getting the data. Then there is a general program. So while we wait for GRBs, we point the X-ray telescope and the visible telescope to selected sources, which are being defined now. Of course, we prefer sources which are uh, which have X-ray emission and visible emission, so we can use both instruments uh, very helpfully. And then we have this uh, target of opportunity program, which I will explain on the next uh, slide. And then you see here the share between the three programs. So the GRB, we evaluate about 25% of the time. And the general program at the beginning will be, uh, the first three years will be 65%. Uh, and then it will, and the TO will be 15% with one TO per day. And uh, then, after three years, uh, when we know, we understand better the satellite and we have done uh, uh, the main science of the general program, we will increase, we plan to increase the TO up to five TOs per day. Uh, so here is a general, some uh, comments on the, the general program and the target of opportunity of, opportunity uh, program. What is important here is that we recently added a facility, which is a short message uh, communication with BOM, with Beidou. We, we added, uh, the Chinese uh, ad added uh, a receiver for Beidou, and we can send short messages uh, that uh, permit to, to do, uh, to, to ask the satellite 
to do target of opportunity observation, oops, sorry, uh, as soon as we have decided that, decided that it is interesting. And one another feature which I would like to, to emphasize here is that we have set up a, a whole system to be able to cover large uh, error uh, boxes. So making one observation is something which is easy, but having many, uh, many observations and tiling the sky is quite complicated. And we have set up a mechanism to do that, to be able to uh, observe a full gravitational wave error boxes. So I will not comment the instrument, you will have them on, on the slide. So just to show you here, we'll go quickly through all the instruments, but not without command. You see here the, on the left, the, the text will give the performance of the instrument. And on the right, you, you see pictures. So here for Eclair is the, the detection plane, the mask, the full instrument integrated, an image with a, a source, and here's the onboard calculator. Here you have the three GRM modules and their, uh, uh, their uh, calcula uh, calculator here and some performance. Here, the X-ray uh, telescope, the optics here and the camera here and the instrument ready to go for calibration here. Uh, the visible telescope here, uh, we uh, undergoing the prototype undergoing some uh, testing on the sky and here one interesting strategy which is to to make one bit images with some uh, very simple threshold and you see that you can identify the images and these uh, images are very quickly sent to the ground and we can find uh, uh, counterparts like that, at least in the first stage. Then the full images are sent to the ground, but on a longer time scale. But these images can be sent to the ground in a few minutes, and uh, then we can find uh, the afterglow very quickly. Then the set of uh, ground wide angle cameras, which will be installed partly in China and partly in uh, Chile. Uh, just to cover, uh, to, to have one set in the night at every time. And here the two ground follow-up telescope, again, one in China and one in Mexico. And uh, what, one, what is interesting is that the one in Mexico will cover up to uh, the near infrared uh, energy range here. And so uh, it will be sensitive to uh, uh, the afterglow, the near infrared afterglow of GRBs up to a chief 10 or uh, 11. Uh, so I uh, reached my conclusion. So observing GRBs, AGN, TDEs, and gravitational wave transient sources, VOM will be a major observatory for the study of black holes and their astrophysical impact. With its unique combination of space and ground facilities, it is expected to become a key player in the fields of high energy astrophysics, time domain astronomy, and multi-messenger astrophysics. These domains are expected to develop very quickly thanks to a new generation of powerful observatories, the Vera Rubin observatories, Pan stars, and ZTF in the visible gravitational wave detectors, SKA and FRB, FRB detectors in the radio, large Newton observatory, CTA, etc., etc. Uh, you will find more information on this paper, which describes the, the mission uh, here, the white paper. And on the Zvom website, you can follow the advance of the, of the project. And the launch is, I think the that is uh, almost uh, secure now, except if we have big problems, is uh, the first quarter of 2023. Thank you very much, and I am uh, ready for questions. Uh, Jean-Luc, yeah. uh, uh, félicitations, and um, it's clear uh, that the mission will certainly have a great scientific results. But what I would like to emphasize in this occasion is that you have been with France, one of the first European country 
to collaborate directly with China in a space mission. And um, at, the, at the beginning, it was not so easy, but you have established the path which has been grandiosely followed, like we have seen this morning by Nanzang and by the Einstein telescope, therefore you are a pioneer and uh, we would like to help in any way um, ICRENET has just developed the international joint PhD in relativistic astrophysics between, uh, uh, between the USTC, the University of Ferrara, and uh, this activity will be centered at Villarat in Nice. Therefore, this will be an, a further occasion to collaborate. Congratulations again. I'm sure you will have great success with this. Thank you mission. very much, uh, Remo. I really appreciate your comment. And uh, yes, Ukrainet is very helpful also in this, uh, in this business. So thank you. Uh, if there are more questions, please ask them in the Q&A or in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I take the occasion. Uh, if you have a question, you were uh, mentioning a sensitivity in the soft X rays of this uh, particular mission, so uh, which is uh, supposed to be useful for detection of uh, high redshift JBs, very distant. So, what is your expectation? Of how uh, how far you can go with redshift with detections of these JBs? So the the. Yes, there are two, two points, in fact. One, one is uh, the energy range, and the second is the effective area, of course, and we, we have smaller, I mean, the ZWOM satellite, I did not say that, but it's about uh, uh, 950 kilograms, so it's not like uh, as big as SWIFT, and Eclairs has uh, 1,000 square centimeters of uh, uh, detectors, so it's also less than sweet. So, however, the, the low energy threshold kind of compensates for that. So we have made uh, simulations and we expect uh, more or less to, to double the, it, it depends. If we leave five years as expected, we expect to, to double the number of uh, um, gamma ray bursts beyond redshift six which we have uh, now. So what, what, what we expect is not to get a large number, like maybe other mission uh, want to do, but uh, it is uh, to have uh, high redshift burst with better uh, environment and follow up to, to understand them better. Because they are rare events, they, with them, they will continue to be rare, but we will have a better uh, follow up and environment to study them. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, apparently there are no, no questions from the audience. Everything is clear. So thank you once more, uh, Renaud. Thank you very much. Uh, we thank you. Uh, move to the next speaker of this session, Jim Linden, please. Uh, you may start sharing the screen. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to introduce a, a rather new project, the Southern Wide Field Gamma Ray Observatory, SWGO. So SWGO is um, a project um, for the highest energy gamma rays um, that we know about, which are accessible only from the ground due to the limited collection area of, of satellite-based instrumentations. So I'm talking now about ground-based gamma ray um, astronomy. And there are two established techniques for doing astronomy um, from the ground with gamma rays. The first, well, but both make use of the extensive air showers produced by um, incoming high energy photons. Firstly, we can directly detect the particles in this electromagnetic cascade. To do that, you need to go to mountain altitudes, um, and, but then you have particle detectors then, which can, can detect these sharp particles and their arrival times, and hence infer the direction of the, the primary gamma ray. 
or you can image the Cherenkov light that's produced in the air by these sharp particles um, using, <coughs> sorry, using uh, telescopes and ultra-fast cameras that allow you to then image this nanosecond flash. Now, the two techniques um, are complementary to each other. With an Air Cherenkov telescope, um, I can make a very precise measurement if I have a large array of telescopes. Um, I see the, the maximum of the, of the shower, so I've got a very good measurement of shower energy. Um, I can get a very large collection area, um, but I have some limitations. I have a, a modest field of view. Well, it depends what you compare to, a few, a few degree uh, diameter field of view. Um, and I need darkness, so I have um, uh, lost quite a, a large fraction of the, of the time. The, the other technique uses sort of closed particle detectors, so it works day and night. Um, and can observe the whole overhead sky. Yeah. So despite the fact that typically the precision that we achieve is more limited and the collection area is limited by the size of the, of the array on the, on the ground, um, this is still a very interesting technique for, in terms of wide field and high duty cycle measurements. So five well-established observatories exist um, making such ground-based gamma ray measurements three Cherenkov telescope arrays, MAGIC, VERITAS, and, and HESS, um, and two of these ground-based particle detectors at high altitude. The first is, is Hawk in, in Mexico, um, and the, the emerging one, um, sorry, I've, I neglect uh, an instrument in Tibet that I should have added, um, an emerging one in China, which is LASA, which we heard about this morning um, from, from Roy, Roy Yu. So um, these instruments over the last few years or a couple of, couple of decades have established um, a catalog of TV up to now PV gamma ray sources. Um, the, the total number is not particularly impressive in the astronomical standards, about 240, but there's um, an extreme variety of, uh, in terms of the source classes and the kind of emission we, we see. So from um, micro quasars up to, to very large scale um, jets, distant blazars, gamma ray bursts, pulsar wind nebulae, colliding with binaries, supernova remnants, starburst galaxies. So what, what we've concluded from this, I mean, this is still essentially the tip of the iceberg because this is a, a new field, but it seems that the ability to accelerate particles up to TeV energies and beyond this is actually rather common in astrophysical systems. And that with very high energy photons, we have a powerful tool to understand this non-thermal astrophysics, um, which complements strongly existing radio and uh, X-ray non-thermal um, probes and other messengers as I'll come to later. So, um, looking to the future and, and deepening our understanding of the high energy sky, and the non-thermal universe, there are two big projects that I'm now going to, going to mention, um, which make use of these two different techniques, which I introduced uh, earlier. So SWGO using the ground particle uh, technique and CTA, the Cherenkov telescope array, uh, making um, air Cherenkov measurements. So firstly, CTA, which is not, is not the topic of, of my talk, but I, I can't not talk about it. I've been personally closely involved with the project for many, many years. And CTA is, is a tremendous instrument. Um, it will push in many, many different areas in terms of performance, as indicated um, here. It's a general purpose instrument, extremely powerful and sensitive. Um, but it can't do everything and and i think what i want to persuade you today is that cta is very nicely complemented by these wide field of view uh, ground particle based detectors so obviously for more information about cta you can see for example these these links um so in terms of the wide field of view instruments um i start here with as an example the the, the all sky map that's derived from from hawk you see a band of emission along the galactic plane and, and some point like extragalactic sources of, of gamma rays. Um, in the last weeks, 
this has been uh, complemented by new results from from lasso as you as we heard this morning from, uh, from Rahul. very exciting results extending this uh, picture of the high energy sky to even higher energies these are source 12 new sources above um, 100 tev uh, 10 to the 14 electron volts um, really extraordinary energies um, showing the potential of these ground-based measurements uh, particularly at the high energy end. So this is very all very exciting, but there's there's something wrong with this this map of the sky, which is hopefully fairly obvious, which is the huge hole in the southern sky. Lasso and Hawke are, are northern hemisphere instruments. They um, have almost no sensitivity at the galactic center um, and for the for the um, innermost galaxy. So. Key targets of SWGO include the, the galactic center and the, the central molecular zone, of course, the, cent the central supermassive black hole, but also structures that are associated to that, to that region on much larger scales, including the, the, the Fermi um, bubbles, now the, now the E. Rosita bubbles. Um, and, and these structures are very much easier to see from the, the southern, uh, from a southern site than, than from the north. And between Hawke and Lasso and SWGO, we, we have essentially a full, a full map of the whole uh, sky in these, in these energies. The Fermi bubbles, we expect to, to see um, the extension of the, the emission characterized by Fermi in, in SWGO um, and to be able to distinguish between different models for the origin of the bubbles using the, the high energy spectrum and morphology, um, which is an important contribution. So the collaboration came together um, for our first meeting as a collaboration only at the end of 2019. So we're, we're a new collaboration. We managed one in-person collaboration meeting before the pandemic, which was a bit unfortunate. Um, but nonetheless, we've made a lot of progress and we've, we've built up quite a big international collaboration. Um, particularly important for us is this very strong South American role in the project, given the um, intention to cite SWGO in, in South America. But we also have strong participation from, from the US and Europe and several other countries around the world. Okay, so the basic concept of SWGO um, is similar to that of Hawke and Lars. So we will detect particles of the ground from, from cosmic gamma rays um, using um, Cherenkov light produced in the water and fast and sensitive uh, photosensors. Um, with a, a very high fill factor inner array, collecting essentially all of the particles that reach the ground um, close to the, the bottom of the, of the shower, but um, a sparser array giving us very, very large collection area and potentially at very high energies. So that's the basic idea. Um, we put together a, um, a, a set of targets for ourselves for our intended roughly three year design um, study phase in which we want to select the site of SWGO and um, establish the, the design, base, the baseline design. We, we have a lot of activity now. These are just some, some uh, names of the very active people in the, um, the, the, the coordinators of these different working groups that we've established. We've ticked off a few of our milestones the next big steps in the project are site shortlisting and to define some candidate configura configurations and finally to, to select from those to, to define the, the baseline design. Okay, so where will we build SWGO? The, um, the, the good news is we have a number of very, very promising sites. We're, we're spoiled for choice in four different countries. Um, in the Andes, we have um, options in, in Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, and Peru um, at close to five kilometer altitude, uh, all good candidate um, sites. So this is just the, the, full, the full details of the, the altitude and the, and the locations of these, these different options. Some of them are neighboring existing astronomical facilities, such as close to Alma in, in Chile, um, some of them are, would be breaking um, new ground. Now, um, one, one of these, you, you notice this is um, Laguna Sabina Cocha. This is a lake, um, and this is maybe not the most obvious 
um, location to deploy um, our instrumentation. But we have three different options for containing the water for our water trunk of detectors. We have uh, tanks, which is a bit like Hawk, an artificial um, building or pond, which is more like Lasso. Um, and then finally, deployment directly into a natural lake is something we're also exploring. So these are sealed, uh, light tight units with pure water inside. But the, the support for this is coming from the and shielding from, from particles is coming from the, the water in the pond or the lake. And in the end, of course, the, the optimization process is a, is a performance cost optimization. And we have many other aspects to, to optimize, including unit dimensions and photo sense of choice, etc. So um, to choose a site for SWGO, we obviously need to do a lot of work in terms of characterizing the sites and understanding the, um, the practical implications of building of those sites and the, and the cost. Um, and we've, we've started to do that. Obviously, it's a bit tough during the pandemic um, to organize site visits, but a lot is possible with, with satellite data. Um, a, an, an autonomous environmental characterization station, this is our aero site, has been designed and it's going to be shipped uh, in the next weeks to, to the candidate sites, um, just to, to increase our understanding of the very local conditions. Um, in the case of the lakes, we've started to, to measure the um, the depth profile of candidate lakes and also look at starting to look at, at waves um, and other aspects that would affect the detector design. So a lot of work is, is going in and this work will lead to a short list of sites and eventually a, a site selection with the short list, something we're aiming for very soon. Similarly, in the area of detector development and design finalization, we, we're doing a lot of prototyping work. We're evaluating um, different technologies for all aspects of the detector, uh, including steel tanks or rotor molded um, plastic tanks, um, different options for the, for the photosensors and the electronics. But we have end-to-end -end prototypes now of, of um, the electronics chain to, to, to read out from photosensor to read out. Um, we have in the case of the, the lake option built at my own institute, the, the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg, a test pool, which we're using to evaluate um, the performance of candidate detector units in a sort of lake, lake like environment. So this is a huge work, which is pushing us towards our, our baseline um, design, which is something we, we hope to have in a, in a year and a half or, uh, or two years. So, the, the basis of our performance optimization is, is simulations. We, we rely on simulations of, of air showers uh, and of our detector. Um, and we're, we're lucky that we're able to build on the analysis and simulations framework that was developed for, for Hawk. So this is a proven um, tested framework. Um, and now we've, we've added the sort of flexibility to it that we can test all sorts of different kind of detector units and options. This big tank is, is a Hawk tank. We can have multiple photo sensors in, in one volume. We can have uh, reflective walls, which is why you see all these red uh, photons bouncing around here and not here. This is black uh, walls inside. This is white um, and, and different detector geometries in multiple layers. So all of this is under intense study right now, um, but we have the framework now in very good shape. Um, in order to to reach our final design, we decided to establish a reference configuration um, early on, which is something that we think is sort of scientifically a, a plausible um, array that we can establish a cost for and which we know is, is re realizable with, with no tech, new technology developments with things we have in our hands right now. And this then serves as our reference to, to compare alternative approaches, which require a little bit more um, development. So here we, we have, this is just listing the choices made for the, for the, um, for the reference and the other options that we still have um, open. Uh, we also have a, a layout defined for that, a, a very compact central array, which is uh, on the same scale as the inner array of Lasso, about four times bigger than Hawk, uh, and a sparse uh, outer array. And the tanks of the reference configuration you see here, they have two, two layers. 
Um, the reason for that is um, we have an upper layer which makes a sort of calorimetric measurement of the electrons and the photons arriving at the, at the ground. Um, and the lower compartment is designed to, to measure uh, muons arriving at the ground that pass straight through easily the, the upper compartment. Um, and as demonstrated by, by Lasso, this muon tagging is an extremely powerful way of rejecting the background of, of charged cosmic rays um, that arrive at, at the Earth. So um, there is another way to do this, which we're exploring in parallel, which is to make use of multiple photosensors in the same detector unit um, to, to tag the, the muons from their sort of well-defined through growing and growing uh, trajectory. Uh, and this is also very promising and, and is being evaluated and in the end, of course, this is a cost performance trade off to decide. So just to to illustrate, these are these are simulations of a couple of gamma ray showers seen um, with our reference configuration. Um, and this really just illustrates that even for energies which were a bit challenging for for current instruments, we have um, about a few hundred GV, we have very large um, uh, we have a lot of signals, a lot of tanks hit, and we uh, can measure rather precisely the, the location of the, the impact point on the ground and the direction of these, of these showers and get rid of the background. So obviously, as this gets to higher and higher energy, the amount of information increases dramatically and our ability uh, to do accurate reconstruction and background rejection increases uh, as the energies go up. But, but even Below TV, which has been challenging with this ground particle technique in the, in the past, we think we can do much, much better. And this is in part due to a higher altitude uh, and in part due to the uh, improved individual detector units. So I'm afraid I can't show you today a, uh, a real performance curve for SWGO because we're still in the process of optimizing the design. But I can show you our kind of target zone or our, our, our face Space exploration zone. We're confident that we can meet or exceed the uh, curve that we had a few years ago, which we called our sort of straw man um, design. Um, we have lots of developments in the areas of improving the angular resolution and the background rejection that should push us somewhere into this yellow zone. <clears throat> uh, and also lots of ideas for how to push the performance of low energies. Um, and also, we would like, ideally, to increase the footprint of the detector with a lower fill factor outer detector to approach or, or maybe even exceed the, the collection area of LASO eventually to have a really complementary PV detector in the southern hemisphere. Um, similarly, for, for resolution, we have here a sort of target zone that we're aiming for. The lower bound comes from a sort of recent study we did with, with rather a with some idealistic, uh, idealized detector and, and maybe some optimistic assumptions, but somewhere in this zone we, we hope uh, to get, which would allow us to achieve basically unprecedented um, resolution for such a wide field instrument um, in the in the gamma ray domain. Um, Lasso for comparison is sort of somewhere um, up here. Okay, so we set ourselves um, early in the project some. Uh, science benchmark cases, which we think are the kind of should dr drive our design. Our design should um, be one that uh, can tackle each of these individual science uh, cases. Uh, as was as just discussed by, by Jean Luc, the uh, gamma ray bursts are an important science case for, for SWGO. I'll come, I'll come to that briefly in, in a second. Uh, and transient sources in general, gravitational wave alerts, and, and so on. Um, Particle acceleration in our own galaxy um, is a key um, aspect in terms of extending uh, the, the known spectra to very, very, very high energies, characterizing the, the morphology of sources. We're interested in um, the relativistic winds associated to, to young pulsars and the pulsar wind nebulae and, and, and halos around these nebulae, which are now established in the TEV domain. The Fermi bubbles, as I mentioned earlier, are a key target with the, with the goal of um, understanding the origin of the bubbles and the, the nature of the high energy emission. Um, dark matter is um, another uh, target, which I'll come to in a little bit more detail um, 
in a minute, the, the Southern Hemisphere lo location and the wide field of view give us a unique possibility to probe the, the halo of our galaxy and, and WIMP annihilation, if, if this uh, is a real thing, which I'll come to. Uh, and finally, we can look at the charged cosmic rays. They're our background, but they're also of interest. The anisotropy in particular of the, the charged cosmic rays can uh, tell us a lot about local magnetic fields and the pro propagation of um, relativistic particles. So just a few a few more specifics on, on some um, cases. These, these studies were all done with somewhat pessimistic performance estimates, so you can hope for, for better than, than this. Gamma ray bursts, um, the, the sensitivity um, of SWGO will, will not meet that of CTA um, for gamma ray bursts, but being a wide field um, instrument, there is the capability to detect prompt emission. And, and SWGO has the sensitivity for the kind of gamma ray bursts that have been detected in the last couple of years from the ground for the first time, would have been visible um, in the early phase with, with SWGO. So this I think is interesting also in, in the context of this FOM talk we just heard. Um, in terms of really characterizing the very early behavior of, of, of gamma ray bursts. But also, again, with the wide field of view, there's a, there's a, a, new, a unique opportunity to probe very large error boxes from, from, gamma, uh, from gravitational wave alerts. Um, we will be able to search for, for nearby pulsars, which are invisible through other means. I don't have time to go into that in detail, but please ask if you're interested. Um, and we want the sensitivity to be able to monitor the activity of, of, of nearby uh, active galaxies. And this, this helps us to support the CTA, but also the, um, the neutrino telescopes. So I'll also mention briefly uh, in, a, in a moment. So um, there is, of course, then huge promise in terms of characterizing the acceleration of particles to the highest energies. Um, in our own galaxy, in particular associated with our own supermassive black hole um, and the, the inner parts of our own galaxy. Okay, so very um, briefly, the I want to highlight how SWGO will work together, I'll be able to work together with CTA. And I've done that by, by this diagram, which illustrates variability time scales for different classes of objects. And they just sorted here in terms of distance scale um, and what I show is the sort of range of variability timescales, which is established in the TV or the very high energy gamma ray domain. So we have fast distant transients like gamma ray bursts, and then we have extended galactic emission, which doesn't vary um, at all. Um, and these are the three ways that I think uh, SWGO and, and CTA can work together most effectively. So being a very wide field uh, instrument and probing the whole sky, SWGO may um, detect high energy sources that have not yet been followed, uh, observed by CTA uh, and trigger such observations. The monitoring by SWGO of, uh, of active galaxies in particular, but also potentially um, galactic variable objects such as binary systems can um, allow us to trigger CTA and CTA has higher sensitivity than SWGO, particularly on short time scales, um, and so can really help to characterize very fast variability, uh, having been triggered by SWGO. And finally, as I, as I mentioned, as a, as a wide field instrument, SWGO has the capability to detect prompt emission from from gamma ray bursts and other transients, and can then trigger CTA to do more detailed follow-up work and, and measure the emission um, into the afterglow where uh, the SWGO um, sensitivity would not be sufficient. So they work really well, I think, together as, uh, as, a, as a combination. Um, I wanted to mention in a little bit more detail the, the dark matter search capability. Um, the WIMP is maybe not right now the most fashionable um, dark matter candidate, but I think it's still the best motivated. Um, and that a weakly interacting massive particle left over as a thermal relic from the Big Bang makes up the dark matter. I still find a very compelling uh, option to explain the, the dark matter that we, we know exists. 
And if this scenario holds, the nice thing is we, we have um, a prediction for the velocity weighted cross section for annihilation of weakly interacting massive particles um, in the present universe that comes um, naturally from knowing the density of dark matter. Um, and with some caveats on annihilation channels and the uh, some uncertainties on the, the, the shape of the halo of the, uh, of a, of the, um, the dark matter halo of our own galaxy, we can see how instruments like CTA and SWGO can, can do in, in mapping out this, this dark matter. SWGO is helped by its very wide field of, um, of view to, to track the halo onto larger spatial scales. Um, but the two again work together very, very well. Um, and between Fermi and CTA and SWGO over the next uh, decades, this hypothesis can either be confirmed or really ruled out um, the, one of the options for the, the nature of dark matter. The final thing um, I wanted to, to mention are the synergies between SWGO and neutrino telescopes. So the combination of SWGO and, and LASSO um, will produce a full sky map of emission in the domain from a TEV, well, from well below a TEV, um, up to um, PEV energies. Um, and this is really, really complementary to what we'll achieve with the next generation, in particular of neutrino telescopes, so the, the Ice Cube Gen 2 um, and the Gen 3 net detectors in the Mediterranean. Um, in the neutrino instruments, we're, we'll always have a lot uh, lower statistics in terms of the number of detected neutrinos. I mean, the neutrino cross section is, is tiny compared to the, the gamma ray cross section across. Um, but there is the nice feature of the neutrinos that this it's an unambiguous, <coughs> excuse me, an unambiguous signature of pion um, decay emission. So combining the sort of detailed view of the of the gamma rays with the the, the neutrino view and this. Um, clear pi zero uh, so pi on a uh, charge pi on decay picture um, will be really powerful for understanding the uh, relativistic particle populations of our own galaxy and, and beyond. So this, this I think is an exciting possibility. Um, that also brings me then to my conclusions. So I hope I convinced you in this brief talk that the Southern sky really needs a, a very wide field um, instrument operating in the domain from, from uh, hundred, hundreds of GV up to the PEV domain, um, really to give a complete coverage of the whole sky. The southern sky, of course, is important. It contains the, the galactic center, and, uh, and that has uh, a lot of implications in terms of nocturnal astrophysics and the search for dark matter, as I just mentioned. But it's really then complementary to, to LASSO, the project we heard about this morning, um, in providing this all sky view. And it has strong synergies with the Cherenkov telescope array and the new generation of neutrino telescopes. Um, as I hopefully convinced you, the targets are, are transient phenomena given the, the high duty cycle. We'll, we'll look at the sky all the time with a wide field of view, mapping out large scale um, emission and uh, following um, cosmic particle accelerators to very, very, very high energies. So despite the pandemic, we, we are advancing in our, in our design and in our site choices. Um, if, you, if I give this talk or one of my colleagues again in, in a year, um, you'll see the, the progress that's made towards the design. We, we hope to have detailed performance curves um, on this kind of timescales. But we're still very open to new partners and new ideas. So if you're interested in the project, please don't hesitate to, to get in touch. And we're really looking forward to strong partnerships in the future with many collaborations and many different wave bands and messengers, but, but in particular with LASSO and with CTA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, for this nice talk. Well, uh, let me just uh, comment shortly first at all very impressive presentation strong case please identify soon the lake or the place is urgent to activate very quickly this uh, observa observatory in the in the south urgent 
because uh, we have this urgency since uh, we have learned the lecture. It took 50 years to develop uh, uh, the X-ray and thought from space and uh, reach uh, LATA and the identification of the black hole. But there is something new this year, which has been well clarified in the, in the lecture of Mirzo Yan. There is TEV radiation coming from gamma ray burst. And we expect that many, many uh, gamma ray burst will emit in TEV. Therefore, yeah. Jeff was, but uh, from the discussion of uh, the presentation of the 12 cases of LASO, it is clear to, uh, to some of us that there is also something very, very new related to supernova, which is not just the neutron star. And um, there is uh, some evidence that in addition to the neutron star, there could be very well also a black hole. Therefore, this is something which urge to have more observation from supernova in the PEV, because the second component um, is very, very exciting. Therefore, we are at the verge of a new field. And uh, please hurry up, find the best place, and be operative as soon as possible. I know that the people at um, in Brazil, uh, you have a very good people working on that. Yeah. Keep going strongly. So many, many, many thanks for this support. And we will do our best to do this in a, in a timely manner. Yeah. There's no questions. Maybe we can take Oh, you, please. You may speak. Hello, Liu, can you, can you speak? Can you hear me? Oh. Sorry, okay. Hi, hi, it's a very exciting talk. Um, I, I have a question on this uh, uh, angular resolution expected. So, uh, so you, I, I see I, I, the SWGO can reach a very nice angular resolution over 0.05 or even better. Um, so how, how, maybe I should uh, read the winner's paper, but uh, could you explain how, how to reach such a high res angular resolution? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I should emphasize this, this is the kind of resolution we would have with our inner detector. Yeah, so, the, the combination of sort of square kilometers of collection area and very high energy at very high angular resolution is, is very, very difficult. But, but for the small area where we collect basically all of the shell particles of the ground, we have a huge amount of, of information from the arrival times of all those particles. Um, and with a likelihood based technique, which accounts for the fact there's a sort of tail of the, of the, mm -hmm. of the particles. This, this is what we get. So the Werner's paper sort of does this using every shower particle and, and sort of probes the limits, but we can get... Ah, we can get so, so you need to uh, put the, uh, a dense array of, of, of the particle detector. It, requ it requires a dense array. To get okay. Them. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you once again, Jim, for this nice talk. Now we move to the last uh, talk of uh, this morning session. Nicholas White is going to present uh, the gamma explorer mission. Thanks, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, you can see your screen, please. Okay. Start. Okay, thank you. Let me scan into. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, so very early in the morning here, so uh, I apologize if I seem a bit sleepy. 
And I also apologize, I was not able to listen to the other talks in the session just because I was sleeping. But, uh, uh, anyway, I'd like to talk to you today about the Gamma of Explorer. This is a proposal that we are currently working on, a proposal for a, a, sp a space mission to NASA that will go in at the end of this year. Uh, it's uh, a cost cap mission of 290 million plus, plus the launch. And if we're successful with this proposal, then it will launch in 2028. And uh, why is it called Gamov? Well, uh, I'm from George Washington University, and uh, the uh, uh, one of our uh, esteemed previous uh, professors was George Gamov, and in fact, uh, using his desk at the university. And so we felt that it would be good to recognize his achievements uh, by naming this explorer after him. So we have a large consortium of uh, institutions and people involved with this, about uh, 50 people. And um, so I'm from George Washington University in Washington. Uh, the NASA Center that's helping us put this together is the Jet Propulsion Lab in California. And uh, the number of institutions, I won't go through them all, uh, who are supporting this uh, international group of folks. And uh, a lot of work has happened. This has been going for about three years now. and. Uh, and we're pretty uh, mature now for the proposal that's about to go in. So this is a gamma ray burst mission, and uh, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, gamma ray bursts are the uh, most powerful, most luminous explosions known, and uh, you usually end up in the formation of a black hole and uh, a resulting jet. And uh, if we have to be looking down that jet, then uh, we see a bright gamma ray burst, and then, which is from shocks within the jet, the relativistic jet, and um, as that jet plows into the circumstellar circum uh, medium, uh, it produces an afterglow, and uh, that afterglow can be used as a bright light as, and uh, as it decays. And the trick is to get to the gamma ray burst quickly, find it, and get to it quickly, and then use it. Uh, so they're both um, traces of massive star formation. Uh, we believe it's uh, massive stars that explode that create the gamma ray burst. There's also um, a lot of interest recently in gravitational wave events. Gamma ray bursts can also be created by merging neutron stars. And uh, again, uh, similar mechanisms, a jet is formed, black holes formed, a jet, and uh, one sees a gamma ray bursts associated with a gravitational wave event and this stirred a lot of excitement a few years ago, uh, first EM counterpart to a gravitational wave event. So we have two major goals for this mission. Uh, the first goal is basically to start using gamma ray bursts uh, as a cosmological probe. And the, uh, the idea here is, as I said before, they're very luminous explosions and if you can get to them early, they are very bright. And so we can observe them out to the very highest redshifts. And in particular, we are seeing gamma ray bursts coming from the period of reionization. So redshifts uh, six, seven, eight, nine. And, uh, and we want to take it to the next step and use them to map reionization by basically looking at the bright light of the GRB and taking spectra and looking at the fingerprints of uh, what's between us and the gamma ray burst uh, to probe the period of reionization. And uh, in doing that, we can also see metal lines in the spectra and probe metal enrichment in the early universe. And something that's intrinsic in itself and interest is, you know, what, what is going on with GRB production at high redshift in a particular, uh, perhaps population three stars, those enigmatic first stars, um, perhaps may give off gamma ray bursts and perhaps we can, uh, uh, see them that way by just seeing their GRB when they die to, from the first stars. The second goal is uh, multi-messenger astrophysics. As I mentioned, uh, there's this famous event uh, happened in August of 2017, uh, where there was a gravitational wave uh, event that was coincident with a, uh, a GRB, a gamma ray burst that was seen by Fermi and Integral. And that led to an identification of a kilonova uh, on the sky, which um, uh, basically proved the theory that short gamma ray bursts are associated with merging neutron stars. And uh, these are more nearby events um, that, that are being seen. So this is kind of near universe. Um, and we want to basically take it this to the next step and have a capability to rapidly identify electromagnetic counterparts to, uh, to gravitational wave events. 
So let me start with the first goal, which is uh, the high redshift universe. So this shows you the current state of the art in terms of measuring the redshifts of GRVs. The SWIFT mission, which has been running now for about 15 years, the Neil Garrell SWIFT Observatory, um, basically is the state of the art in identifying uh, GRBs. It has a, a wide field of view uh, instrument called the BAT, which finds a GRB, and then an X-ray telescope and a UV optical telescope, which then uh, the spacecraft points in the direction of that GRB and finds a counterpart, the afterglow. And then that can be used to uh, identify a, gal a host galaxy and, uh, and measure the redshift. And you'll see from this histogram that we have we are seeing GRBs at very high redshifts, and in fact higher redshifts than the than quasars. And so they are very complementary to other techniques for probing the high redshift universe, and in particular because they're so bright. And so we want to the rate with Swift is be I mean Swift has done some really good work, but. Um, but the rate is painfully slow. Uh, we're seeing a high redshift GRB uh, like every two or three years, and that's um, great, but we really want to get that rate up at least by a factor of 10 so we can start to use it as probes. Uh, so the, the big, um, so what Swift discovered was uh, that when you look at uh, these high redshift GRBs, you see a, a Lyman alpha dropout um, which is caused by the intervening material. And in particular, in this case, it's a combination of the absorption of the galaxy itself and um, the intergalactic medium. And you see all the classic things that you see in quasars. This is a redshift 6.3 uh, GRB. You see uh, the Lyman alpha cutoff with the damping wing, uh, the gum piece and trough. And you can, you may not believe it by looking at this, but there, there is also a Lyman beta forest lines and metal absorption lines. Now, that, again, I want to emphasize this is really complementary to other ways of probing the high redshift universe. And the nice thing about GRBs is they are very clean parallel spectra. Um, there's no sort of uh, stuff coming from an active AGN in the galaxy. Um, they also reside in star forming galaxies and typically are very um, low mass galaxies. Uh, so they're probing a kind of a different uh, regime in the high redshift universe. And as I say, they're being seen at a redshift nine. So before I talk more about the science, let me tell you about the mission and how we're putting it together. So the, the problem we have at the moment is that um, it's a lot of GRBs are being seen. And it used to be every GRB was interesting and everyone is interesting in its own right, but uh, we need to sort out which are the high redshift ones so we can tell the ground-based, the large ground-based telescopes where to point. And you know they're not gonna point to every GRB these days. Um, we need to tell them which are the which are the really uh, interesting events. And so um, we've built into the structure of the mission, um, built into the DNA, if you like, in the mission that we're going to alert the large ground and space-based telescopes. So that's James Webb, um, Keck, uh, the GTC in the Canary Islands, um, the ESO telescopes in Gemini, to to get the responses we need and do as quickly as possible, as early as possible, when the GRB is at its brightest. So we're, we're designing it to actually be very efficient in doing this. Now, as I, as I said, these are very high, uh, very rare events. And um, even with the capability we're going to do for this mission, uh, only a few, um, you know, and probably like every month, to two months, uh, we're going to see a high redshift event. And the large ground-based space-based facilities need to know reliably when to go and point. And so our strategy is basically um, to efficiently and rapidly identify the rare high redshift events uh, so we don't uh, lose any and then do it in parts of the sky which are optimized for follow-up by James Webb Space Telescope and ground-based telescope. So um, you know, there's no point in looking at the south uh, ecliptic pole because it's very hard for telescopes to go there. So, so we're going to try and optimize so, um, so uh, CAC or uh, GTC can basically go as quickly as possible to these GR GRBs. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to, we've are going we modeled this, this mission basically on um, the Neil Garrell Swift Observatory, a similar kind of technique, and also the original Beppo Sachs Observatory, which discovered the afterglows of, of GRBs. And so we have two instruments. One is a wide field of view X-ray telescope, and we're using lobster eye X-ray optics to do that, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those in a second, but they basically can cover a large 
region of the sky, thousand square degrees, um, and find the GRB and locate it to our uh, locate it to art minute precision. And then we repoint the spacecraft very quickly within a hundred seconds to point an infrared telescope at the, uh, the the region of the sky where the GRB came from to find the afterglow and to do two things. One to measure its position very accurately to our second precision. But the second thing is basically to um, look for a, a Lyman alpha dropout to, uh, to, to, to see this is a high redshift GRB and to tell the ground within a thousand seconds of the GRB trigger that where to look and what the redshift is so that, uh, that people can uh, repoint their large telescopes. Uh, the second part of this is that we also want to have the capability to respond to gravitational wave events. So we're also including an uplink capability to repoint both the X-ray optics and the infrared telescope um, within 100 seconds to some area of the sky where there may be a, a gravitational wave event happening. So this is a very powerful combination. So why do we go to the X-rays to find the gamma ray bursts? Uh, I mean, these are gamma ray bursts, so you should look in the gamma ray. Well, it turns out that um, if you're going to high redshift, um, the GRV spectrum is being redshifted down. Um, you also want to go to fainter GRB so you can, you can find um, uh, the higher redshift ones. And so when you put all this together and use X-ray lobster eye optics, um, you really uh, want to increase the sensitivity in the X-ray band uh, to find more of these and the high redshift ones and also to get the kind of precision we need in terms of locations on the sky. And when we do that with, with the, what we're calling the Lobster Eye X-ray Telescope, um, this shows you a comparison of where we are today with where we will be with, with the Gamma Observatory. Um, so if we start going around uh, clockwise, so first that black line, um, uh, if I get the pointer to work here on that. Okay, maybe not. Uh, but uh, the black line shows you the observed swift rate. So on the uh, y-axis, we have the number of GRVs uh, um, uh, cumulative plot versus redshift. And for swift, you can see that um, we're only getting about one third of the redshifts for all the GRVs it's seeing. The blue line shows you if it was 100% of redshift retrieval for swift, that's the rate we would get. And the yellow line and the red line shows you the um, the rates we're predicting for uh, gamma. -op. So you can see there's a huge improvement, especially at high redshifts above six, uh, factor of 10 or more. And we're going from red, uh, from uh, GRB rates of, a, of um, uh, very low rates to, very, uh, to rates where we're gonna get at least once a month um, a GRB at high redshift. Now, let me talk a little bit more about this Lobster Eye X-ray Telescope that's going to do this. Um, so this is uh, based on how a Lobster Eye works. It was um, proposed by uh, Roger Angel back in 1979, and it's finally coming to fruition, uh, being flown in various missions. I think you heard earlier about the Einstein probe, which is also using these optics. Um, we're going to fly two modules that basically will cover uh, more than a thousand square degrees of the sky, um, it'll be in the soft X-ray band. Uh, we'll have at least a seven hour minute precision and that will give us localizations to one to two hour minutes uh, radius. And um, there's a lot of heritage now with these devices. The focal plane, which is the, the image is projected onto, which gives us very distinctive cross shape with a core uh, PSF. Um, this is just standard CCDs produced by MIT. And uh, each detector, uh, it's a two by four array of detectors that show laid out to, to follow the optics um, and uh, cover the field of view. And this is produced by uh, MIT. I'll mention this whole instrument is led by the Marshall Space Flight Center. So basically the optics will come from Leicester in the UK, the focal plane from MIT, and then it'll all come together at Marshall Space Flight Center and be integrated and tested there. So the other part of the equation is getting the redshifts. So we're going to have an onboard photo Z telescope, and this is a very well uh, tested technique. Um, this shows you an example of a GRB uh, 090423, um, where you can see that it's visible in the J, H, and K bands, but you don't see it in the Y band. And this is basically the photo, the Lyman alpha dropout 
<clears throat> this has been used to identify high ratio quasars and high ratio objects now. It's a pretty standard technique. And so we want to utilize it here to tell us, you know, do we have a high ratio of GRB or not? And uh, it's a very simple method. And, uh, and it means we can design a very simple infrared telescope to do this. Uh, this JPL is working on this. It's a simple RC design. Um, we're going to use a dichroic beam splitter using prisms. Uh, to project onto a single detector, and we're using a flight spare detector from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, there's fortunately a whole bunch of them sitting at uh, NASA Goddard, um, and uh, so we're going to use one of those, and um, that saves us a bunch of money and keeps us from that cross cap I mentioned earlier. And uh, so this is JPL is working on this this instrument, and it means we can simultaneously do five bands. So GRBs are highly variable, and it's very good to see. Um, you want to see all five bands at the same time. Now to set the parameters for this telescope, uh, this is some work done by Alex Kahn on the right, um, where he's taken basically all the afterglow light curves uh, found by Swift um, and measured from predominantly ground-based telescopes and then re and redshifted them to basically redshift six. So he's both time dilated them and adjusted the luminosities for cosmological effects <clears throat> to show what all the um, GRB afterflows look like. And we can use this to sense, set the sensitivity requirements for the instrument. So we want to get to the, uh, get a redshift measurement within a thousand seconds. And that shows you that blue dotted line. And we want to get at least 80% of these uh, as redshift. So that sets the other direction. And that sets a sensitivity of about 15 microgen skis, which is an AV of order 21. Um, and this can be accomplished with a, a very modest 30 centimeter telescope in space. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this shows you the sensitivity of the NeoSpec instrument on James Webb. James Webb actually has a two day, uh, what's called disruptive TOO um, mode where you can read points. It does take two days, unfortunately, but James Webb is so powerful that we are still very sensitive to uh, getting uh, good uh, spectra um, uh, of the afterglow to do the measurements we want to do. So there's basically, in terms of getting these high redshift GRBs, uh, you're basically, you have a predicted rate, which I showed you, you have an observational efficiency, which we're gonna make very high, 95% or better. And then the redshift retrieval rate. And as I mentioned, Swift has a 30% redshift retrieval rate, it still does, um, still operating. Um, with gamma off, we're going to make this at least an 80% redshift retrieval, and we're going to make the uh, uh, use a, an observationally efficient orbit. So we're going to put this mission into an L2 orbit where there's no the Earth does not get in the way, basically. And so by doing this, we really up the rates from, as I say, like every other year, you get a high redshift GRB. Although Swift actually, uh, recent times, has not really been finding them because I think the ground-based telescopes are just not responding anymore. Um, with gamma off, we will get, um, as I say, probably once every month or two months, a high redshift event. And even though those numbers still may seem small, uh, simulations we've been doing, which I'll show you shortly, show that we, we can actually do some very impressive um, science on reionization and uh, early metal uh, enrichment. Just wanted to mention the orbit we're using, the uh, L2 orbit. Um, this has become a, a, a great place to put astronomical telescopes. That's where James Webb is going. Um, uh, the Erosita is there. And uh, it means it's basically uninterrupted. And it means we can also um, point in directions of the sky that are optimal for follow up. So, for example, the James Webb Space Telescope has a field of regard that is where it can observe on the sky. It has to be between 135 and 85 degrees from the sun. So we will point into that region. So we know every high redshift GRB is available in James Webb. And we'll also optimize it for both Hawaii and Canary Islands and Chile to make sure those telescopes can do it. Um, and this kind of shows you, this is some work done by Jamie Cano, who, who runs the Swift uh, Science Operations Center, showing the field of view of gamma of select instrument, the, what we're using to detect the GRB. Um, with a different constraint. So the green is the galactic plane, which we're trying to avoid. The red bullseye going through is the anti-sun direction. Um, and the other bullseye is the sun direction. And you can see that we're able to basically avoid all the nasty parts of the sky 
those two lines across show you sort of a deck constraint. So to make sure it's available to all the ground based telescopes that can be relaxed if we need to, uh, especially if we want to focus on say Northern hemisphere or Southern hemisphere. The last part of this is we need to get the um, GRB uh, information down as quickly as possible. So we're using two ways to get the data down. We're going to have a low data rate, real time communications um, that uh, will be 24 seven. And uh, it's actually using very modest, what's it called, K, K satellite, uh, four meter, 3.7 meter aperture um, ground stations. Um, and these we can get down in about uh, six to seven kilobits of uh, science data, which is quite adequate to tell us where the GRB is happened, where it is, and what its redshift is. And we can also use it to uplink and, and re repoint the spacecraft uh, on demand, so to speak. And then we'll have a, a, a high data rate, uh, like once a week, where we download all the production data, and uh, that will come through the, uh, the NASA uh, Deep Space Network. Okay, so um, let me just talk a little bit about the science that we're going to do with this mission. So probably the biggest theme of the mission is doing the uh, reorganization and turning GRVs into something that, you know, in, in themselves, they're interesting, but to use them as astrophysical probes and to really understand what is going on with reionization, the period of time when the universe went from a neutral hydrogen phase uh, to ionized. And the question is, what reionized the universe? Uh, how quickly did it happen? Um, was it caused by uh, UV emission from massive star formation? And uh, you know, how much UV EV was produced? And, uh, and then could it get out of the galaxies to actually reionize the IGM? And if it isn't that, then what is it? So we're going to measure with this mission the global star formation rate, um, the escape fraction, and the timeline and topography and two chemical enrichment at the same time. So this shows you, uh, I pulled this from a paper by Ota et al. Um, I think there's probably some more recent plots around, but it gives you an idea of the constraints on reionization. Uh, the the y-axis is the, uh, the fraction, the uh, neutral fraction, um, going from one at high redshifts to, uh, to opaque, uh, to op one and opaque at high redshifts to uh, uh, transmissive at lower redshifts. And the blue area is the constraints from the Planck mission. Um, this is an integral measurement. So it gives a, it tells us the reionization probably happened between six and uh, nine. It doesn't tell us a lot of detail. And those points you can see are current measurements from different techniques, including quasars, uh, GRBs, the green lines, uh, green uh, points, uh, Lyman alpha emitters and, and other techniques. And you can see at the moment, there's really no real constraints on reionization. So what will we get with this mission? So there's a paper that uh, is now on the preprint server by Adam Litz. Litz, it's uh, work that's been done by him and others, um, projecting what kind of performance could we get from a gamma ray burst mission um, where we have uh, say 20 GRBs, that's our fiducial for gamma. Um, assuming a particular star formation rate at uh, high redshifts, which then tracks the number of GRBs, um, and then maybe an enhanced star formation rate. And then uh, we also included the projection for the Theseus mission, which is a very similar mission that uh, unfortunately ESA did, decided not to proceed with. Um, that was announced about a month ago, but uh, that would have, uh, in its best case scenario, gotten maybe 80 GRBs. And you can see that uh, for, for this particular model of the IGM, uh, that uh, we can do really well, uh, even with 20 GRBs, which are the black uh, lines, which I hope you can see. Um, the blue line, sorry, um, and the black lines is the best case, and the red is somewhere in between. So we can really uh, get very good measurements for this particular model, and then test different models for uh, you know, rapid reionization or slow reionization. And this is kind of, you know, this would be a definitive uh, measurement uh, using a, you know, a particular probe of the high redshift universe. Now, this, this, uh, another thing we can do with this mission is measure the escape fraction, the number of uh, UV photons that are getting out of the galaxy. I mean, the galaxy itself has neutral hydrogen in it, and um, the photons have to get out of the galaxy to re reionize the IGM. And this shows you a GRB at around redshift of six, 5.91, um, showing the Lyman, the Lyman alpha line. And in this case, it's dominated by the galaxy. And, um, and this 
what we expect at the redshifts around six that the galaxy will dominate, whereas at higher redshifts, the IGM will dominate as, as it uh, becomes neutral. Uh, but for, for this case, you can actually measure the um, uh, hydrogen absorption in the galaxy and use that to constrain how much of the UV photons get out to realize the uh, IGM. And in this case, it's pretty high, the absorption, and probably would not be sufficient to, to reionize the IGM. And so this is a measurement that these are measurements this is work done by Neil Tanvir, where he's basically taken um, uh, a lot of GRB measurements and measured the, uh, the columns uh, in the galaxies and in the lower redshift universe um, are not, uh, there's a lot of absorption and, and not enough to get uh, the photons out. Um, with gamma, if we will look at redshift five, six and beyond um, to make these measurements and see in the high redshift universe, you know, can enough UV photons get out? And in doing that, we can uh, measure the escape fraction. And this is a pretty unique measurement uh, to, to this kind of uh, GRB mission. Um, and the blue uh, lines show you kind of the constraints for 20 GRBs, um, the uh, escape fraction on the x-axis, and then a, 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 U, a UV flux measured in the infrared because it's high redshift, uh, you know, how, how bright are the galaxies, and, and whether or not there's enough photons to reionize the universe and that. It's basically on the right side of that red line. Okay, uh, just quickly, I will talk about the uh, chemical enrichment. This shows you uh, one of the fainter GRBs at high redshift that's been seen. Um, and even a VLTX shooter spectrum after two hours is, I mean, it'd be good enough to do the Lyman alpha dropout, but it's not really good enough to do metal absorption, but it shows you what the coming ELT would would obtain on that GRB, and you can see all these metal lines, um, which tell you a lot about um, the, the metals in the in predominantly in the host galaxy uh, in this particular case. And um, and so we want to use these metal lines to basically trace the abundance um, of metals uh, with redshift. And this shows you a plot for Q, you know, quasars and GRBs. Um, the, the GRBs are squares, the quasars are crosses. Um, out to, to redshift six. And you can see there are some trends there to lower metallicity in the higher redshift universe, um, as you would expect, but we really want to get above redshift six and we can use GRBs to do that. And this shows you some simulations done by uh, Louise Mar Rebas at uh, Caltech JPL. And they're uh, showing that, you know, we can get down to metallicities of uh, a hundredth, even a, a thousandth um, out of these high redshifts. And this is really important in constraining um, the chemical evolution of the universe and how the first metals um, were polluted basically the IGM and, and the early galaxies. And lastly, um, just the GRB rate as a function of redshift tells us a lot about star formation and what the stars that are basically creating the, the GRBs. Um, this is some work from Dan Purley from 2016 using the SWIFT sample um, where he plots the number of GRBs as a function of redshift. And the red is the, um, the star formation rate from uh, other methods. And you can see the GRB rate roughly tracks star formation. There are some differences uh, and there seems to be a effects coming from metallicity. Uh, GRBs seem to favor low metallicity environments. Um, and we expect at high redshifts, uh, things will change, especially um, uh, the uh, you know, population of three stars may come in, the lower metallicities cause different effects. Um, and so we're really looking to improve the error bars in this high redshift region, which are pretty large at the moment. And this is some work that's being done by Chris Farr at Los Alamos and Amy Lean at uh, Goddard. Um, basically taking, um, supernova rates and uh, you know what fraction of those are GRBs and then looking at uh, star formation rates and how that changes the redshift making assumptions on how the IMF underlying IMF may change metallicities percentage types and so on and so forth and I won't, don't have time to go into all the models but it shows you predictions for the uh, number of GRBs per year and, and this is uh, uh, you can see there's big differences and so what we observe, we can use to basically constrain um, models for GRBs and the underlying population of, of the create GRBs. And uh, so this is uh, you know, going to be very important work as to just the fundamentals of what creates GRBs. 
So let me finish by talking about the other science goal, which is uh, to find X-ray and optical counterparts to gravitational wave events. These Lobstri X-ray telescopes are excellent uh, wide field of view instruments. And with a thousand square degree field of view, that's ideal for pointing at the, um, the, the area of sky where a gravitational wave event is, going, is, is occurring. I mean, some will occur naturally in the field of view, especially the black hole mergers. Uh, though we're not really anticipating big electromagnetic signatures there. But uh, for the binary neutron star and potentially neutron star black hole mergers, um, we're expecting a big increase in sensitivity from the ground-based gravitational wave detectors, the so-called A plus or O5 run, which is now currently projected to start in 2026. Uh, other people on this, at this conference may have a more up-to-date date on that. But we want to have this capability up there um, to be coincident with the O5A plus run and, and even the future projected um, capabilities that are coming. And our idea is basically to trigger the, the next instrument, this wide field of view X ray optics, to be on target within 100 to 1,000 seconds for half of the sky. And if we see an X ray source, then to point the infrared telescope to get an arc second position and characterize uh, the kilonova as, as it as it starts and evolves. And we have a horizon of about 200 megaparsecs, which is, um, which is pretty well, uh, pretty consistent with um, what uh, is going to be happening with A+. And I'd also note this is, will be a great capability for time domain astronomy, um, uh, following up neutrino events and, and other uh, gamma ray, uh, and, and just in general, so say the LSST, Rubin uh, telescope and, uh, and what, uh, transient events that supernovae or whatever it sees. Uh, let's see, so I'll skip that, but we're, I mean, the rate, I'll just say the rates for the uh, A plus are very uncertain. And, uh, you know, it could be one a month, or it could be um, one a year, it could be who knows. So, um, you know, it's a lot of uh, modeling out there trying to you know, be optimistic or pessimistic. But what we, what we would like to do is basically get, um, pointed at these events as they are happening. And we're, it's possible to get a pre-alert. Uh, these mergers, as they begin, um, you can actually get an alert before the merger happens from the ground-based gravitational wave uh, capabilities. And we're designing this so we actually start the maneuver to point the next at the area of sky where it's, it's happening and potentially catch the merger in the act and see X-ray emission either from the short gamma ray burst or, or other um, processes going on in the early phase of, of the merger. And this shows you some projections based on previous uh, short gamma ray bursts uh, that we can see. So I'll, I'll wrap up there. Um, I think maybe a little over time, but I just wanna say that, uh, you know, this mission is very exciting. We're, so we're in the process of proposing it and uh, it will go in at the end of this year, and then we go through a long process to see whether it will be accepted, which takes two or three years. Um, and we will launch it in 2028. Um, we really want to turn it around using gamma ray, just you know, observing gamma ray bursts because they're interesting in themselves to actually using them as cosmological probes. We want to have a launch in 2028 that overlaps James Webb and then the A plus gravitational wave. And, we see it as a key component of the multi-messenger time domain astrophysics network at the end of the decade. And we're optimizing it um, by putting it at, the L, at L2 for, for follow-up observations and rapid response so we don't have to worry about the Earth getting in the way and other uh, complications in low Earth orbit. And a lot of this technology is ready to fly. It's high heritage. And we are welcoming international contributions. The mission's quite mature now, but we're still uh, interested in adding international contributions. So feel free to get in touch with me and I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Nick, uh, yes, please. Yes, thank you, Nick, for, for this, uh, for your effort to present in uh, this wonderful talk, especially this early in your time, uh, but uh, it was worth, I hope. Uh, and uh, we are, yes, please uh, have a last question. Um, there is any question? If not, uh, I would like to... Um, uh, Nick, are you there? I'm still here, yeah. Yes. 
Well, uh, one of the good things about the meeting is that everything is recorded in YouTube, and there have been a lot of discussions about also the gravitational waves that are recorded, and it will be good to, look, to go back to this. But I would like just to mention something different. It, uh, it is um, um, clear that the gamma ray bursts are very important. That is no problem. But it's also clear that there are new aspects of gamma ray burst, which we have not yet used, uh, used and uh, focused on. And uh, it is extremely important to have high resolution, more short time scale in uh, the around 0603 MeV. Because uh, there, is, there are phenomena which we call the UPA phase in GRB, very powerful, like 19 of 114C, which last only two seconds. In these two seconds, more than 40% of the GRB energy is emitted. 40%. And that, that uh, uh, which we call ultra uh, prompt emission, a structure. And to know the structure on shorter and shorter time scale, therefore you need a source powerful and close enough, but you need a detector with short time scale could be the key of a new science of uh, quantum, effect, quantum uh, process, discrete quantum process. This is a new window. And similarly, there is a new window in the early phase of the, GR, of the, of the most powerful GRB in the first fraction of second at, after the trigger, this time in the X-ray. Therefore, uh, there is a new frontier to take into account. We uh, will send you some of the recent paper which we are under uh, uh, and uh, they are on the verge, but you can already find some in the presentation though. The, but to tell you that there is even in gamma ray burst a new frontier, which is nothing to do with, uh, <laughs> with the gravity. Uh, because yeah. I think really the action is in the GRB on short term scale, because they can tell us about fundamental physics. You, we have heard some of the presentation, very exciting, about to look not to the classical, that is okay, to the quantum structure of the signal in GRB. It's fantastically important. It goes really to the art of fundamental physics. Therefore, keep going because, but be careful about time resolution. As yeah, much well. time resolution you can get is very, very precious. Yep. I mean, there are a number of uh, especially CubeSat missions that are being designed with that kind of time resolution. And uh, so we, what we're doing is, is trying to be complementary with other gamma ray burst missions that are being planned at the same time. And then we can be simultaneous with them. Yes. Uh, to see GRBs and fit in with their... But uh, let's be emphasize, it's not uh, a small amount of energy which goes in this quantum effect. I'm speaking about 40% of the energy of a GRB. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Okay. Th th thank you again for the very, very beautiful talk. Very interesting. Yes, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, we uh, still have some five minutes before the round table starts, so we can still have uh, some questions for all the speakers of this session or the previous session this morning. So anybody interested, please uh, raise your hand and uh, you can ask your question.
Okay, since there is no question, audience. Therefore, we are going to end uh, this last uh, um, plenary session of uh, Master Grossman meeting. And in five minutes, we will start uh, the round table, what is in the Galactic Center. Uh, it will be the first uh, talk by Professor Gensel. And uh, then we will have some uh, discussion after his talk. So, uh, Professor Gensel, if you are online, could you please, uh, just to make a test, share your screen a moment and see if everything works. Five minutes coffee break. Yes, please. We will do a so. short test now. For the okay, sure. Yeah. No problem whatsoever. There we go. Yeah, we can see you. Yes, we can see your slide. Perfect. All right, got it. Right. Everything is great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. We just wait a few minutes. Sure. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Okay, 
let's start with um, the pre uh, uh, with the yes okay we can start with Reinhard Genzel a 40 year journey please uh, Reinhard proceed thank you Raymond Let's see, the last time I guess I talked at one of your conferences must have been about nine years ago. Um, and I'll hope I can show you that lots has happened in this field and uh, some amazing uh, scientific progress as well as technical progress. And so I wanna do this uh, by describing this in a more global way. Uh, that's why I call it the 40 year journey. I could have called it the 100 year journey, as you will see in a second, because of course, this is all part of a bigger story. Um, our story, my story started about 40 years ago, when I joined Charlie Towns' group in Berkeley. And as you will see from my talk, that's when we in fact, when I got involved in this uh, project to test uh, the massive black hole paradigm uh, and with it general relativity in the regime where it has not been tested yet uh, by using the, the center of our uh, Milky Way. Now, of course, as you, as you might imagine, this has been a, a, a true journey in the sense of many people uh, working on this over time. As you will see, technology and innovation in technology plays an enormous role in this, as, as it does in other fields, of course. And, and so I'm very grateful to uh, uh, the many young people and not so young people who have been uh, working with me lately using interferometry as a new tool in the infrared to achieve micro arc second uh, astrometry, which is really an, a, a new game uh, in, in, in astronomy, as you will see. Now, of course, we are really celebrating also more than 100 years of general relativity. And uh, I don't think I need to go in any detail here uh, to explain that, of course, the theoretical work, which started in, uh, with the famous talk of 1915 in Berlin, and then Schwarzschild's solution one year later, Kerr's solution in 1963, Roger Penrose's uh, more general uh, discussion of the singularity and the possibility in nature to actually realize uh, black holes. And then the first attempts by Hawking and others to understand the still not understood tricky aspects uh, of the quantum nature of, of such a black hole. Okay, so all of this, of course, uh, by itself took 50 years to mature and is still not finished. And as you well know, it took about the same time uh, until the first uh, observational evidence became available that such objects called black holes nowadays uh, might actually be realized. Um, one of them was the uh, discovery of uh, X-ray binaries by uh, Ricardo Giacconi and others, and uh, objects which we now believe are stellar black holes or stellar black holes and, and neutron stars in spiraling. And of course, as you will see in a second, we have uh, absolutely wonderful uh, convincing evidence for this now through the gravitational waves. Uh, the other one was a discovery of the quasars through uh, the radio astronomy community showing that there are objects at, at great distances. We now know quasars to, you know, basically about 800 million years after the Big Bang, uh, very luminous objects between uh, about a thousand to a hundred thousand times the uh, emission the luminosity of the sun, um, oh, sorry, of, of the Milky Way, all combined within a few light years of a, of a central point. So that, of course, led to an intense discussion, as most of you know, um, how one can possibly test 
um, that these objects really, these quasars really are uh, accreting black holes, which had been the outcome of sort of the majority of the theoretical work in the 1960s. And it took a long time, really. Um, by the 1970s, as you will see, the first serious experiment started on using uh, nearby galaxies in the galactic center uh, to get at this problem with gas motions and Doppler motions. And then over time, uh, two groups, one here in Munich with uh, outliers in, in France, in, in Cologne, in Heidelberg, uh, Portugal, and so forth, uh, and one in UCLA, uh, led by Andrea Guess, Mark Morris, uh, Eric Becklin, uh, using the, the, the Mauna Kea Keck telescopes, basically set out to use uh, stars as the best way of testing the gravitational potential and see whether there might be a compact object. And that's the story, of course, which I will tell you about uh, pretty much at the same time and still more difficult uh, in, in technology uh, was the discovery of the gravitational waves. What a moment that was in uh, uh, four, four or five years ago when the, the first in-spiral was detected. And then finally, the radio astronomy community using uh, at short millimeter wavelength uh, telescopes across the earth in intercontinental interferometry to actually see uh, the accretion zone uh, and resolve it uh, spatially. Now there's a lot of contact between the work I will discuss from our side and, and that of the uh, radio astronomers. Um, and, and we very much like, would like to see uh, an image of the galactic center, just like what you see here from M87, which was published in 2019. I'll come back to this. So the progress has been very fast in the last few years. And we've made uh, enormous uh, progress in actually verifying the black hole paradigm. As I said, the uh, story in the galactic center um, started in the 1970s. Uh, this was following a paper by Lyndon Bell and Reese, who basically, uh, of course, analyzed the quasar situation uh, knowing full well that the resolution and sensitivity of the equipment was not good enough to see any uh, uh, effect of the of the gravitation of the central black hole, if there's one, onto the environment, like on the stars and the gas in quasars, because of the large distances. So Lyndon Bell and Rees argued, well, perhaps quasars were just sort of the active part of the black, massive black hole population in the universe, uh, others not fed at, at such high rates, but present perhaps in, in many and in, in perhaps even all uh, more massive galaxies. That, that um, hypothesis, of course, has, has turned out to be correct. And we, are, we are following the uh, uh, cosmic evolution of, or co-evolution co of galaxies. And, and black holes in, in, in great detail nowadays. But at the time, that was sort of a, a, a leap of faith. Uh, but immediately, of course, pointing the, um, the, the, the spotlight on the nearest galaxy, namely our own. Um, the only disadvantage being that you cannot observe the galactic center in optical light. Too much dust in between us and, and the center of the Milky Way. So you have to go to a longer wavelengths, the infrared, and you see a, a modern uh, uh, multi-color infrared image in front of you of the central few light years in the galactic center uh, using eight meter telescopes, using adaptive optics and everything else we now have available to us to really look into the uh, central region at some in some uh, absolutely uh, fantastic uh, detail. Uh, so having this, uh, this kind of opportunity to look at the stars, then uh, the next question is, how might you, how might you um, see that there is a central object in here? Well, the first one, of course, is you might look for a compact radio source. It's very much like in, 
uh, also quasars. And indeed, the radio astronomy community discovered one, Sag A star, at the center of this very dense star cluster, which is more than a million times denser than the solar neighborhood. And we now know from such observations that this object is indeed very, very compact. We don't have an image quite yet, uh, but uh, the size measurements show it to be uh, less than 40 micro arc seconds in, in radius, I should say. And, and so this is a very, very compact source, consistent with um, potentially the uh, accretion zone around uh, a massive black hole. Now in Berkeley, Charlie Towns, uh, having turned astronomer from his earlier work in, on masers and lasers, um, started to build equipment, spectroscopy equipment in, in the few micron to 10 micron region. And uh, the, he and his group, and I joined this group then as a postdoc, were looking at the gas in this very central region. Again, you see Sergei star, but in addition, uh, the pink um, clouds, there is ionized gas, streamers of ionized gas, obviously uh, orbiting in some fashion around uh, the radio source. Likewise, the green is, is neutral gas, which is also uh, moving. So we, at that time, were able to, to build equipment to see the, the Doppler motions of these gas clouds, and they were large, much larger than you would have expected uh, from the uh, the sum of all the stars, which you see here in blue. So by the mid eighties, uh, the Towns group wrote a nature paper where we uh, told everyone that uh, there was a few million solar masses in the central few light years, and it was unlikely to be the star cluster. Basically the, the evidence goes from, uh, you know, map, mapping out the mass enclosed within radius as you go away from Sag A star. And then you see at large distances that of course the mass increases, which is uh, because there's a extended mass due to the stars, but within about one parsec or so, and inside of that, these innermost gas clouds uh, showed a more or less constant uh, mass distribution. So that would be the, the evidence for a compact compact mass. And that was a few million, two, two to four million uh, solar masses. Now, is that a black hole? Well, it could be one, but obviously you are working here at about 10 to six times the uh, event horizon uh, size. So there are many other possibilities. There could be uh, dense clusters of neutron stars, um, other, other, other clusters of, of very faint stars, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that is certainly not good enough to be a very convincing piece of evidence as seen from, from nowadays. Also, many people felt that gas motions might not be reliable traces of, of gravity because magnetic fields, of course, uh, are likely to be strong in this region and would, would uh, change the motions of the gases especially the ionized gas. And there could be stellar winds and other things which would push the gas around. So many people uh, in the field felt, no, this is not, not yet good enough. You have, to, you have to go closer and you have to have a tracer, which is a you know, more likely, more believable uh, tracer of the, this, the, the mass distribution. But that required technology. We didn't at that time actually have good enough Im imaging detectors in the infrared the American uh, military had, but only over the next uh, five or six years uh, was it possible to transfer that technology over to the, uh, to the astronomy community in the US and then here in Europe. So when I started in Munich as a, as a new director, we made that our one of our new um, aims to to build a, a basically cameras and then also imaging imaging spectroscopy uh, apparatus uh, to look into the into the galactic center. Another problem, of course, is when you take a big telescope in order to have good resolution and look at a at a star. Well, then the waves coming from that star are distorted by the turbulent atmosphere. That is a big effect in the optical, such that if you integrate without doing anything, the sharpness of the image is uh, 
uh, about a tenth of that uh, which you might get through diffraction. And as you well know, the solution nowadays is adaptive optics. You basically sense the distortions of the atmosphere, then you have a, a deformable mirror in the path, and then you can uh, take that initial dis distorted image which you see on the right and make it sharp at the diffraction of the telescope, you see the first area ring. So that technology became possible and then routine in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, such that eight meter telescopes nowadays, of course, uh, work uh, uh, at high resolution, 50 milli arc second uh, resolution. Now, not always do you have a star near the object. And so another technology which we had to develop uh, was to basically create your own star near where you want to observe uh, by shooting up lasers in the upper atmosphere, uh, focus it there and use resonant backscattering by, by sodium atoms uh, to basically sense the distortions of the atmosphere with your own uh, artificial star. So all of these technologies uh, had to be introduced over the next uh, years and um, I'll come to another one next uh, uh, and have improved the sensitivity and, and, and uh, angular resolution by factors between 10 and 1,000 uh, over, over these, uh, these years. So the two groups um, uh, working in the 1990s, we from uh, the telescopes of uh, the European Southern Observatory initially a three and a half meter telescope and then uh, the, the VLT, eight meter telescopes. And then a little later, Andreas uh, group using the Keck telescopes basically started making uh, images, uh, uh, astrometric images uh, with this equipment of stars near Sag stars. So this image here, in fact, is a superposition of images from three different years in red and green and blue and Sag star is that yellow green cross and the light month uh, on this scale is this, is this circle. So you see obviously from superposing these images that close to Sag star, there are some objects, some stars which move so fast that the images uh, are easily separable uh, from year to year to year. And if you look at the upper right, uh, then you see how much that would be in terms of a true velocity and it comes out to be several thousand uh, kilometers per second. That's something which we published in, the, in, in 96 and 97. And a year later, also the, the Keck group came out with the same result. And when you look at the motions here, you immediately see that uh, the Kepler's uh, laws work quite well for you uh, in the sense that the motions inside near Sagittarius are, are obviously much greater than the outer ones, which are look like white uh, stars. And that's that's basically one of a square of R, which works for you. So if you then interpret these average motions in terms of a mass distribution, what you find is that there is, uh, you know, about two to four million solar masses within uh, about a light month. So that's the same result as we had a, a decade earlier with the gas, but now with a reliable tracer and a little further in by some factor of, of three. So the question again comes, is this, is this a, a black hole? And the answer is it could be, uh, but of course, uh, while we have moved inwards, we're still uh, a several hundred thousand away from uh, in terms of uh, event horizon uh, radii. And so uh, other things could perhaps uh, um, fit in there. Plus the other thing is, this is a statistical measurement. You can measure the uh, motions on the sky, the X and the Y. You can also measure through spectroscopy, the stellar velocity Doppler motion along the, along the line of sight, but you cannot, uh, and you can measure, of course, the position of the star X and Y, but you cannot uh, obtain a measurement of the Z coordinate. So the number of observed uh, quantities per star is not sufficient to derive an orbit and therefore then a mass. So this is a statistical measurement. And that's of course, uh, 
is uncertain because of the limited, num limited number of stars. So how could you do this better? Well, first you want to go closer still, if possible, if there are stars. And second, uh, um, you want to see uh, accelerations of, the, uh, of these motions so that you can actually in, uh, invert the problem and find what the individual orbital motions are. That seemed, that seemed very, very ambitious <clears throat> in, the, in the late 90s at the stage uh, I'm talking about here because the orbital time scales of the most of the stars here are hundreds, hundreds of years. So that clearly is a, is, a, is, a, is a hard call. But then we were lucky. Nature gave us some stars which are close enough and at the same time have short enough uh, orbital periods. Uh, Andrea's group uh, first saw uh, accelerations in 2000 and then one of the stars, S02 or S2, uh, came around uh, a parry of only 17 light hours away from the black hole in 2002. Both groups followed this motion and uh, that really that really opened the doors to precision tests because now we could from that one orbit uh, alone measure a precise mass for about 4 million solar masses. We now knew that it is within 17 light hours or fraction thereof, and that's only a few thousand uh, short shield radii. So we really have now very, very strongly constrained <clears throat> the volume uh, within which that mass um, is. It's the same mass as was measured before, but it's now uh, confined to a region of, uh, you know, a bit, about a hundred short shield radii or so. And so by, by 2002, I think, most people were convinced that this was the best evidence for the existence of massive black holes, although there were a possible configuration like fermion balls or boson stars or other things uh, which you might think of that would fit in here and which could not yet be resolved by the motions. So the question is, uh, what do you do next? Well, we knew that the orbital period <clears throat> uh, was only 16 years. So we knew that the star would come back in 2018. And uh, we felt, okay, when that happens, you better be prepared to measure so much more precisely in, in the spectroscopic domain, but also astrometry wise, uh, that we can see the deviations from, uh, from Newton, uh, see the effects of uh, general relativity, and perhaps even get closer still to the central uh, object. Now I should say, of course, both groups followed these uh, stars. In the meantime, uh, through the proper motions and orbital measurements, and it's really rather spectacular picture which we found in that <clears throat> you see that um, the brighter stars are in a sort of a planar structure. You will see that in a second, uh, the O stars and, and wolf rayet stars, while the fainter stars, are randomly distributed, in fact, on highly elliptical orbits, suprathermal in distribution. Now you see the plane of the O star. So the, the interpretation in astrophysically is quite interesting how this all came about. Normal, uh, normal interactions, two body relaxation is not fast enough because the stars are all too young. Uh, we believe that the, the, the disk stars came in through a gas cloud, which was then shocked and uh, became gravitationally unstable. While the innermost B stars, which uh, are all probes, in fact, for the gravitational potential, uh, basically are you know, uh, objects which m uh, came in as binaries. And then as this binary comes in, uh, one star gets captured and the other one thrown out as a, as a, a hypervelocity star, which in fact such stars have also been seen uh, by now. Now, in preparation for the 2018 event, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had still better resolution. And the way to do this is through interferometry. Of course, interferometry, using the interference uh, of the light between distant telescopes, is something which the radio astronomy community has been doing for 60 years, but not so in the infrared and optical. There, <clears throat> the difficulty is much greater because of the shorter wavelengths 
because of the faster distortion uh, time scales, vibrations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Nevertheless, we we had that ambition to combine the light of the uh, four eight meter telescopes of the ESO <coughs> Paranal Observatory, and we built an equipment we call Gravity, which does that uh, beam combination. A very complex experiment, which Frank Eisenhower as a PI uh, put together with with a team from uh, a number of institutions in Europe. And indeed, by 2016, we had installed it on the mountain ready for the 2018 Perry. So now we had, instead of 50 milli arc second resolution with the single telescopes and adaptive optics, we had three milli arc second resolution. Instead of a few hundred milli arc second, sorry, a few hundred micro arc second astrometry, we now had 20 to 100 micro arc second. So enormous progress. Plus, as you will see, the, uh, uh, the, the, the measurement we are doing now is basic triangulation. We don't have to rely on a reference frame, which we need to understand over a long period of time. So here is a comparison of, the, um, of an, a very nice adaptive optics image from, from 2018 on the left side. So this is 50 milli arc second resolution. Keck images would look just like that. You see the very central core of the stars and you see that star is two. Now, if you squint a little bit, you see that the, the shape of the image is a little distorted. It's not a circle. And that's indeed because in addition to S2, there's also the, uh, the black hole itself, Sagittarius A star, which is radiating as a variable emitter uh, in the infrared. And so that makes the astrometry uh, problem near Perry quite challenging for adaptive optics. Now look now on the right side. Now we look at the same little square there, 100 uh, milli arc second across with uh, the interferometer. In fact, this is data taken just a few weeks ago. And in fact, one week ago uh, with the most recent data set. And uh, this is really stunning in the sense that where you had one star, we now see the black hole itself, which is that yellow thing at zero, zero in the coordinate system, plus currently uh, four stars going through Perry. Four stars, we had not expected that. The one which is labeled K equals 17 or S29 moves with 9,000 kilometers per second. So that's even faster than S2 and it's deeper in the potential than S2, but you see there are other stars. So this is a fantastic situation because now at any given time, we can really uh, check out the potential uh, and make detailed measurements at a level which is 20 times better in astrometry um, than, than before. So this is the picture we had with adaptive optics. And so the current situation is, as, 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 as you see here, uh, the blue curve is the star S2, which went through Perry in 2018, and is now sort of in the upper part of the uh, orbit again, uh, away from the black hole. But at the same time now, Perry uh, is another star, uh, which is that red star, which is so fast, highly elliptical orbit with an ellipticity of 0.98, coming as close as 80 astronomical units to the black hole. 80 astronomical units is about three and a half times the uh, uh, orbital radius of, of Neptune. So this is solar system uh, scales. And then the brown, uh, brown star is going to parry in about a month from now. And the green star is going to parry in about a year from now. So it's, a, it's an incredible story. We thought uh, after the parry of, of S2, we were done for a while. But with the uh, terrific uh, capabilities of the interferometry, uh, we are looking at basically New York at night. You know, it's basically uh, so, much, so busy. And that, of course, gives us the hope to see stars which are still closer to the black hole than, than S2. So here's this uh, a little blow up of this innermost region uh, with these different stars. It's, it's quite interesting actually to, say, to see that uh, S2, which is the blue symbols, and S29, which are the red-orange symbols, 
They seem to overlap each other. And indeed, they come in three-dimensional space within about three milliarc seconds of each other. But the uh, orbital, um, the parry times, of course, are very different. I mean, S2 was three years ago, and, and, and S29 is this year. But you can ask, uh, given their different uh, orbital periods, um, when they will be in the same space. And that happens in about 5,000 years. This is a very short period of time. So clearly, the interaction between stars in this very dense innermost region is a, is a, is a fantastic uh, uh, situation. So near Parry, we can, with the interferometer, uh, see the motion of the star from, from night to night. So that gives us the you know, terrific precision on the astrometric, uh, uh, astrometry of the, of the orbit. Of course, we can also uh, make uh, spectroscopic measurements. So did the Keck group, of course. And we see, uh, in this case, in the case star, uh, for the star is too, how it went through uh, the parade and changed directions and is, is now going outward. Now, when you subtract the best fitting Newton orbit from the, uh, from the data in wavelength space, having, of course, constrained the orbital parameters largely from the astrometry, then you can look for the first deviations uh, from Newtonian physics in wavelength space, and that's the gravitational redshift. And indeed, uh, the Newton uh, orbit is the gray horizontal line, and then the residuals uh, of the data relative to that is the uh, cyan black uh, circles, and general relativity is, is, the, is the red line. So clearly, uh, we clearly have seen uh, uh, the gravitational redshift. Also, the Keck group uh, published a, a, a detection uh, on, on this. So we are very clear. So this is the first order effect. One can see on the order of about uh, 6 by 10 to minus 4. So you need fairly high, high precision in this. The next uh, is the uh, precession of the orbit. That should be, according to general relativity, about 11.9 arc minutes per orbit. Uh, and in fact, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a steady precession because the orbit of S2 is so highly elliptical, but it's more like a kink. So basically you stay on a, a quasi Kepler uh, orbit until you come in and then very rapidly, you, you, the, the, the orbit precesses to a, another Kepler, if you like, 11.9 arc minutes away. And, and it, this precession near the black hole is largely in, in, in one coordinate. So in down below, you see the right ascension residuals from the Newton orbit, which again is the, the gray line, uh, the, the data, again, the cyan uh, black symbols, and general relativity is the, is the red, uh, the red um, uh, curve. Now, you can also, of course, uh, express this whole thing as a rotation on the sky, which is done on the right side. So you take <coughs> the X and Y coordinates and then and look the, at, at the change of the uh, orbital precession. Again, you see how rapidly after the parry in 2018, the star has now gone to a new orbit, which is about 12 arc minutes uh, 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 change prograde relative to the old uh, orbit. So we've seen that, and we've seen a uh, material much closer to the, to, the, uh, to the black hole. As I said, the black hole is variable, and at times it is about 100 times uh, brighter than uh, in, in the normal state. And during such times, you can actually uh, measure the motions uh, of the, of the uh, Sag star in the infrared itself. This is shown in the upper, uh, in the upper left there uh, as a function of time. And you can see that there is sort of a, 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 a clockwise motion from the red point, which was when it started, uh, to the blue point, more or less plausibly centered on Sag A star, which is the uh, the pink uh, the pink curve. So the motion here, which is at about um, 
um, four Schwarzschild radii or eight gravitational radii is about 0.3 C, which is what, what, what you would expect uh, from the coordinate speed uh, of, a, of a circular motion uh, near the innermost stable orbit around a four million solar mass black hole. Now on the same scale, the radio astronomers also can look and see a very compact radio source, which you see down below uh, at three millimeters uh, from 2019 with the Event Horizon Telescope. And that fits in exactly in this uh, sort of uh, motion of the, the circum, uh, um, circumnuclear gas, which we see uh, in the infrared. Now this gas we're seeing here it, it has a gamma of, of about a thousand. And, and what you're seeing is basically synchrotron emission. It's polarized it's synchrotron emission and it's plausibly gas in the accretion zone. We are not sure what the millimeter emission is. It could be the same. It could also be uh, like an M87, a mixture of the photon orbit uh, and this, this uh, uh, gas in the, in, the, in the accretion zone. And it could be uh, from, a, from a jet. That's not yet clear. And we do need uh, a, a one millimeter map, which could resolve that region. The reason technically why the event horizon group hasn't done that yet is the variability. The same variability which we can use to see the motion of the gas, they uh, don't like because then they cannot do a Fourier inversion imaging uh, of, a, of a long track. So that's a technical issue they're working on and very much hope that they will have that solved in, 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 in a year or two. So let me summarize, where are we after 40 years? 40 years ago, we knew there were a few million solar masses within about uh, a few tenth, uh, a few uh, light years or uh, uh, about half a parsec. So that's just on the, uh, uh, basically the sphere of influence of the black hole. In the meantime, we and the Keck group have made ever better measurements of the stellar motions moving inward now being obviously with the uh, measurement of the S2 orbit uh, having a high precision. Uh, and we can say, because we have the, uh, the detections, beautiful detection of the uh, uh, Schwarzschild precession, that any extended mass inside of the S2 orbit can only be a few 10 to minus three of the, of the black hole. Finally, then the radio emission and the infrared flares tell us that the object itself uh, is on the scale of ISCO. That's about as close as we can hope to, to get. So within about three times the Schwarzschild uh, radius. Um, so if you express that in terms of precision, we've come a long way. We can now measure the mass uh, to about uh, 0.003, uh, so 0.3%. Uh, precision, the distance to the galactic center to about 0.1% in precision. We can detect the gravitational redshift uh, to about 4%, the Schwarzschild precession to 5%. We also have, we can measure the uh, equivalence principle in terms of the local positional invariance between helium and hydrogen to about 0 0.05, 0.5%, 5%. And finally, we, as I mentioned, the coordinate speed of that, uh, uh, th that, that gas, that hot gas near the ISCO is consistent with uh, the 4 million solar mass uh, uh, black hole. So that tells us that even in the relativistic limit, we now have, uh, whilst not precision, high precision, but still pretty good evidence uh, that general relativity holds. And this is indeed a mass which is very consistent with a, with a black hole. The precession, by the way, is now so good that we can exclude any additional mass, more massive than a, a hundred or a thousand solar masses uh, in the vicinity. That's very interesting uh, from a point of view of the discussions on uh, gravitational wave in spirals and the question of the rates of extreme mass ratio in spirals, where you would think that there are uh, you know, intermediate mass black holes, maybe 
uh, going into the black hole. Certainly the galactic center seems to be a single black hole uh, or a single central object uh, and then uh, relatively little else. Uh, and you know the stars, of course, which we see make up only a few hundred solar masses. And then there would probably be another uh, 10 or five uh, stellar black holes in this, in this central region. Now, I know we will come to the discussion uh, of uh, the paper by Bekara Begara uh, after my talk, which is basically asking the question, could it be uh, that the conclusion we have that this might be a black hole is not true after all, because instead of a, instead of a black hole, we have a very compact uh, uh, conglomerate of a, of a so-called fermion ball. Now, of course, this, this uh, configuration has been discussed before by Viollier and, 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 and others in the 1990s. Into first order, we, we felt we had excluded it, but let's, let's look at it more closely uh, because the analysis of the Cara Vergara, of course, is, is quite detailed and, 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 and shows that it's perhaps possible to fit in these other, uh, the dark matter uh, solution. Now, of course, that does not include the evidence from the innermost motion, and it does not include the, the radio size. It does put a lot of weight on the motion of G2, which was a gas cloud coming in in 2014, and then on the way out, it started to get slower. And we interpreted that to be uh, gas in the accretion zone, which acted as a drag. And that drag can be numerically determined from the slowing down of the initial Keplerian orbit. Now, actually, it, it, the, the amount of gas which you infer from this, which is this red point, is fully consistent uh, with the extrapolation of other uh, gas measurements, baryonic measurements we have of the accretion zone, both inside as well as outside. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's actually quite expected that there be such, such a drag on the, on, the, on the G2 cloud. And then finally, let me just point that out again, the, the motions of, uh, of the, the gas near ISCO and the size of the, the, of the millimeter emission then makes the point that uh, uh, there has to be, if there's a, if there's a fermion ball, then this, this mass, this open Oppenheimer Volkov mass would have to be, I say 400 to 500 kilo electron volts. So much greater than the, the 50 kilo electron volts uh, motion. But we'll, I'm sure discuss this in the, in the, in the, in the uh, after my, my talk. Let me make one, one final, uh, uh, remark, uh, and that is on the magnetic field. As I said, we, 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 are, we are seeing this innermost gas and it's polarized. And from the polarization, uh, we can say the following things. First of all, the polarization orbits in this uh, uh, innermost region near ISCO, uh, along with the orbital time. So the, 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 the polarization uh, loops have the same orbital period as the, the loops in, in, in motion. And that is a very strong indication that the fields cannot be toroidal in the plane of the accretion flow. Totally unexpected, but must be poloidal and therefore very strong. So the picture we have here, and that's actually reflected by the conclusions of the Event Horizon team in M87, is that we are not dealing with a gas dominated inner region, but a magnetic field dominated inner region, very much what Roger Blandford has been proposing over the last uh, decade, such that the uh, uh, rotation of the black hole uh, mediated through the, through the fields uh, into the uh, uh, circumnuclear uh, uh, region uh, uh, is, is of, of great uh, importance. Of course, all of this has to be uh, tested with more measurements, which, which we will do uh, now that we can finally go to the telescope again. We lost one year, of course, because of COVID, but this year we are beginning to, 
uh, get good, uh, good data. So finally, are we done? The same question I raised several times. And I would say we are very close. So are, of course, our friends from the gravitational waves. And so are hopefully soon uh, the radio astronomy community with the various techniques which I described to you. But what we really have to do is to show that the uh, no-hair theorem uh, is correct, very near ISCO or at the photon orbit. So that this nuisance parameter epsilon uh, is zero and that the quadrupole moment of the black hole, for instance, can be described as a function of the mass m and the spin parameter a. So we need to measure the spin. We hope to measure the spin from stars, which are still further in. And I, uh, the measurements that I've shown you give us great hope, I think, that we might see such stars as we uh, work and also improve the interferometric techniques uh, still more. Current measurements uh, constrain the limit on epsilon to somewhere between 0.3 to 1. Um, if gravity and the EHT can work together, so there is a measurement of the photon orbit and we measure the spin and, and the mass, then we could push that probably to 0.1. If there were a pulsar, which there hasn't been one so far near the massive black hole, then the precision of the timing on the pulsar, of course, is superior and could push that still further. I myself believe that the most likely ultimate measurement is going to be LISA and actually following an extreme mass ratio in spiral, then you get to the level of 0.01. So that would be sort of the ultimate in the field to show that indeed, uh, at least to ISCO or to uh, the photon orbit, uh, uh, the black hole paradigm is correct. And general relativity is, is confirmed also in this extreme regime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reinhard, for this uh, um, review of uh, 40 years of work, very impressive. And uh, it's also very impressive that no matter what, uh, the theory of general relativity seems to be absolutely valid and um, uh, similar in uh, accuracy to the, uh, to, the, to the lectures that we have heard in the first day uh, from uh, Kramer for the binary stars. Yes. The, 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 the refinement which general relativity can be tested, and this is really an example, uh, is fantastic. And uh, I think also in our, in our uh, approach, we rely absolutely on the, on the prediction of general relativity and try to see if uh, the source can be a, a different, but still respecting absolutely general relativity. It's about the source, the topics, yes, sure. about the theory. Let's see, who is going to speak next? I think Carlos is, is he not? No. Ah, there was a question. Shesheng, you have a question? Shesheng, you have a question? No, 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 I don't have it. It's okay. Okay. Then uh, let's go to the next speaker, Carlos. Arguelles. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Remo. Uh, yes, I will select, uh, share the slides. Full screen. Okay, now you see a full screen, right? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. Okay. Okay, well, um, so now I will change a bit the topic and 
I mean, always related to the Milky Way, to Sagittarius A star, but in a different context, uh, putting into the game the dark matter. Um, so we will discuss, uh, continuing with the, well, with a very beautiful presentation of uh, Reinhardt and, and uh, continue with the discussion that he put in the, his last slides about the, our last works where we discussed the geodesics of the S2 star, but also the G2 star uh, around Sagittarius I a star and to uh, try to see uh, or try to dig as, dig as much as possible uh, if there is a possible alternative nature of Sagittarius A star rather than a black hole. So um, the work I will present is based on a series of some uh, several papers uh, present in the last years, including the one of Becerra Vergara and myself, uh, Tal, in the last year, in this year, sorry. And uh, as also uh, rephrased uh, by Remo recently, I would like also to stress that, uh, emphasize that behind the theory I will present, there are also these big names in, in science, which are Einstein, of course, but also Fermi and Boltzmann. So three pillars, I will say, of physics, which uh, will guide us or, or has been guiding us into um, conform this theory. And, and also very interestingly, later on, also the, the contribution of ideas by uh, also Lindenbell, but in this case, in bio and relaxation, uh, which also guide us and, uh, and also Ries and uh, Remo Ruffini uh, also related with the possibility that uh, massive black holes be the direct uh, collapse of dense clusters, which in our case, uh, instead of baryonic matter will be related with dark matter. Okay, so um, let's move to the next slide. First, I will uh, present uh, only a few slides, very roughly an introduction of dark matter and how this dark matter will be related to our theory. So uh, let's suppose that uh, we have a neutral fermion, a dark generic dark matter candidate, uh, with, uh, uh, which uh, was created just after, after inflation, uh, before the CMB, before the photon decoupling. And then due to uh, cosmological perturbations, this uh, the, um, fluctuation in density evolved during the evolution and uh, cooling down of the universe to form the first seeds, the first uh, pristine uh, agglomerations of, of these uh, dark matter seeds that will then the up forming the cosmic web and then um, um, putting the, the underlying gravitational potential in which on top of which the baryonic matter will fall in uh, to form the galaxies as we see today. So um, this uh, hypothetical, in this case, fermionic candidate, uh, if we think of as a cold relic as collisionless and in terms of collisionless fluid, uh, it has been shown in the last decades that astrophysical observations, including CMB, BAO, Lyman Alpha Forest, and the local distribution evolution of galaxies ranging from horizon scales until uh, down to scales between galaxies are all consistent with a universe that was seeded by a scale invariant primordial spectrum and that is dominated by dark energy roughly in a 70%, dark matter in a 25% and baryons plus radiation in a 5%. So this is what uh, gives us the lambda CDM cosmology and very interestingly this, uh, these uh, beautiful observations uh, of Planck uh, about the the CMB that can be explained within cosmological perturbation theory uh, in, the, in the concept of lambda CDM, um, it can be shown very interestingly that in order to explain these uh, temperature fluctuations of this anisotropy map, the, the, is very, the peaks of this anisotropy curve are very sensitive to the dark matter uh, contribution, mainly, yeah, you see here, in the second and third peaks, that uh, the, the, if you would like to, for example, assume that there is no dark matter at all, so the, the, the relation between the heights, uh, the peaks of second and third, 
it will be completely different than observed. And also, if you exceed much more than this 25% here, you will also uh, ruin the, the beautiful observations of uh, temperature fluctuation. Therefore, uh, out of this paradigm, there is a compelling evidence of non-baryonic matter in the CMB, and therefore, it is the need to assume this dark matter rally. From the large scale point of view, uh, there are also very precise and beautiful observations that uh, tell us that the dark matter distributed at large scale, not homogeneously, but in a cosmic well, here in the picture of the left, showing the filaments, the nodes, and the voids. And uh, this is the local universe, which this has been uh, imaged, or this map has been superseded now with the DES survey, which was able to photograph more than 200 billions of galaxies and make it even, even more um, precise. So um, if we now uh, point into one of these nodes and want to zoom in into a halo, which is this schematic uh, picture here on the top, uh, observations of the stars and the, the, the movement of the stars, the circularization of the star, for example, in these galaxies, shows, as uh, you probably know, that uh, dark matter is needed in the mainly, at least in the outer part from these observations, because the circular motion cannot be explained. Uh, the circular motion, which follow this trend in circular velocity, cannot be explained with the dark matter with the baryonic only contribution, which is expected to follow a Keplerian law instead. So, um, so, and this the topic of my talk will start here with the halo of uh, galaxies. And um, and I would like also to stress that the particles I will talk about are uh, neutral fermions. Very interestingly, you can track them as uh, uh, in the very early universe when they were born to then how they evolved from cosmological perturbation theory to form the large scale structure to then conform a halo when relaxing. And then as you, I will show, they can also play a role in the central region of galaxies, including around. So uh, now let's move to the model itself, uh, how fermions when say gravitating, when they relax, form their matter halos in galaxies. So the first uh, key concept here is uh, to say that the fermions, neutral fermions, can uh, under cell gravity do admit a perfect fluid approximation. This was demonstrated in this original work of William Mola Sola in the 69. And then uh, one is able, uh, is, uh, is, is possible then, uh, after this, uh, to use the Tolman of a hyperbolic of equation for a uh, semi discretionary gas of fermions in hydrostatic equilibrium in spherical symmetry. And so um, uh, this, this, this kind of, uh, as uh, Gensel showed uh, recently, this kind of, in the last talk, uh, this kind of uh, equation were uh, solved in this context of fermions in the early nine, well, the first, the first work was in 1990 in the Gaur uh, Ruffini et al. In, to show in general relativity that uh, you can obtain this dense core due to the halo profile for dark matter, but then they were applied later on for Biolier, Mignonese et al. To, to, to try to explain this central contribution of dark matter at the center of galaxies. But in their case, it is important to stress that they were uh, working under um, fully degeneracy approximation. And in, uh, and in this case, I will show that when you include finite temperatures of fermions, which is very important, but also scale velocity of particles, uh, uh, including for evaporation, you deal with a most general solution, which is the one that can uh, uh, gives the much richer phenomenology, as I will show in a moment. So let's, um, these equations are the first two equations. You probably recognize these are written in dimensionless manner, but the first two are the Einstein equation, the only two relevant for the spherical symmetry equation of a state, which is the mass equation, the TOV equation, the second, and then the Klein and Tolman isothermality conditions, and then the uh, energy conservation along geodesic, is written in this manner. So this equation of equilibrium has to be um, given the source of uh, matter, which in this case, of course, will be the, the equation of a state will be written in terms 
in terms of this uh, fermionic phase, coarse grain phase space distribution, which I don't have time to, to, to show the details here, but uh, I refer to the plenarization of, I gave on Thursday to show that this kind of uh, coarse grain phase space can arise from a violent relaxation mechanism, including for the quantum nature of the particle, and then uh, it can be obtained uh, just in, in, in a realistic uh, relaxation mechanism to then plug in in this equation of a state, who uh, in turn will play the role of the source of the Einstein equation. So this is the relativistic energy of the particles, which uh, in, include all regimes, either non-relativistic or relativistic, depending on the momentum. And then, uh, of course, this is a boundary condition problem of this, because this is a couple nonlinear ordinary differential equation uh, where you have to put uh, boundary condition at the center. We will put um, regular conditions. So the mass at the center is not singular. It's not a singularity, it's a regular. Then uh, we will search for general solution with high uh, central degeneracy, theta zero, uh, which is nu over kappa t. Then the temperature parameter beta and then the, the cutoff energy parameter. So here are the four free parameters of our theory, the particle mass, the temperature, the generacy, and cutoff energy, and it has to be given at the center to try to find the most general solution. So this is the solution that uh, Rainer shown in the, his uh, talk about uh, the possibility to have uh, this uh, dense core concentration of fermions at the center of a spherical distribution of, in the halo. And um, so the most general solution, as I'm showing in this plot, shows a, a, a central concentration of fermions, which is called gravity due to uh, degeneracy pressure. So here is poly principle acting, uh, but semi-degenerate, not fully degenerate. So temperature is not uh, tending to zero, but finite. And the transition in a continuous manner when, when uh, to the a Boltzmann, Boltzmannian distribution function where, where, the, where now the pressure is held by thermal pressure. So it, it includes both regimes uh, and it's important that the boundary conditions of this kind of solution here are typical of spiral galaxy uh, halos. These were chosen uh, purposely this way. So you can see that uh, in this uh, transition from core to tail in the, in the density, uh, it goes to 10 to the 4 parsec, typical of uh, halo scaling for spirals, with masses about 10 to 11 for this case. Important point is to, as I said, that the, the central concentration, uh, we can demonstrate that fulfills the quantum condition, meaning that the thermal de Broglie wavelength inside the core fulfills uh, to be larger than three times the interparticle mean distance. And uh, another important point is that this profile, sorry, that these profiles depend on the particle mass, which is another very interesting aspect of uh, these kind of models because uh, you can constrain the compacity of the central cores uh, when you change the particle mass. Which, by the way, these particle masses can also, the, the numbers can also be in agreement with that demonstrate with a large scale structure of the universe and with a primordial candidate of their matter. So now let's move to the Milky Way and to, um, well, the details uh, proper of this uh, discussion. And first, let me very briefly um, run a along the main observations of the Milky Way. So we have, uh, we know at least at first order in the Milky Way, we have a very central, ob uh, central parsec, sorry, governed by a dark compact object, presumably a black hole of four million solar masses, as uh, Rainer showed recently, uh, very uh, splendidly constrained by all the observations uh, of uh, either gravity collaboration on the American team in the last uh, years. Well, then the central kiloparsec outerwards, which is governed by an inner and main frontal bulge. Then we have the disk at 10 kiloparsec roughly, and uh, an outer halo spherically governed by a dermater uh, with, with this number. So. Uh, first, uh, probably the picture you recognize better is this one at the bottom right, which is the data of circular velocity in the halo in linear scale. And I, uh, interestingly also to show the circular velocity uh, in log scale, where you can, we can cover from the first parsec 
so you, you can join, let's say, the circular velocity at least effectively in this is the peak of the bulge in, inside effectively because the error bars here, of course, denote for non-circular motions because in the, towards the center of the galaxy, we have a bar and then non-circular motion band effectively in an effective rotation curve. Uh, this you have here uh, around 30% of, uh, of uh, deviancy for circular velocity, which can be constrained here and will also be used uh, to constrain our model. Because as you, as you saw before, our model uh, runs from the very center of the galaxy until the outer halo. But now, in order to, uh, to ask for all possible constraints towards the very center, we, well, uh, of course, this was uh, explained in detail in the last talk. Let me just recall that this is the, we have the S star clusters, uh, which were, uh, observed by near infrared techniques uh, uh, with the S2, the one that up to now is better constraining the central object, but there are other somewhat closer stars towards the center, uh, to uh, respect to the center. And the nice G2 uh, or um, gas stripping uh, objects uh, like G2, which we also include in our analysis, <clears throat> which is uh, these objects, uh, is nowadays believed to be of a stellar nature, not of a gas cloud, because otherwise sim uh, high resolution simulations are showing that they should have been stripped off uh, after peri, peri center passage. So I recall the, the, the observations, while well, these were a bit uh, uh, of some years ago, this constraint of 4.2 million solar masses, it has to be necessarily inside the first milliparsec and uh, this, has, as I said, this uh, has been uh, beautifully updated in the recent years, also accounting for relativistic, relativistic relative of S2, uh, also by complementing all these results also by American team. So the key question here of this talk is, of this uh, discussion is, can these novel profiles of fermions, of a dense core diluted halo, their potential can explain the Milky Way rotation curve uh, together with the S star dynamics, but also G2 without the, uh, assuming a central black hole. Well, you have to solve the boundary condition problems that I've shown before for specific uh, values of uh, mass at the core, uh, but also to uh, follow the constraints of the mass at the halo scales, including we have also included the the construct of Sagittarius dwarf satellite to, to constrain the mass outside. And so uh, this I show uh, that the, for the first time, uh, a solution of this dense core dilute halo nature of fermions, that the first time it was possible uh, to have a solution that uh, can, the, the fermion ball inside can be inside the S2 pericenter, while the outer halo can also explain the rotation curve was in uh, uh, 2018 in this work was uh, was after I finished the postdoc here in Italy. And uh, for the first time, we extended the more simpler solution of Joliet of uh, early 90s and also of others who deal with this kind of profile, but uh, that uh, formerly they were only doing uh, without taking account the evaporation of particle and therefore the outer tail of was following and a one over r square that uh, we know these profiles are not uh, that much realistic because you have to bound in some box. Uh, well, in this case, you have a, so you have the similar dense core of fermions, dilute halo that I showed before, uh, but in this case, the, the, the size and total mass of the halo is naturally finite. And the most interesting is that the, there is a family of solutions, as I show here, between the, the black curve and the gray curve from particle masses between 48 keV and 300, and nearly 350 keV, which is, this is the, uh, as I think uh, said uh, Reynard uh, about the criticality of this course, well, when you have a finite temperature, the, the criticality of the score is 345 to have a 4.1 million solar masses uh, critical object collapse into a black hole here. This is the critical mass. 
And uh, all of these solutions between the one of 48 keV up to the one of 345, the dense fermion core is dense enough to fill inside the S2 space, the S2 star pericenter, which is this star, blue star here, uh, put here as a average circular velocity of this star in this plot, because this is rotation curve or circular velocity of objects. It is very interesting that uh, in this kind of models that the, the, the solution transition naturally to, to this halo region. So here is quantum uh, uh, fermion degeneracy transition continuously to Boltzmann. But in this transition, the minimum is not spoiling, not, is not spoiling incredibly the, the baryonic contribution that has to be there, meaning this uh, green curve is the, the bulge, while the dash green is the disk, which uh, we used as uh, obtained from observations to constrain the, the rotation curve data, but then rises in the outer part when it is needed roughly at about eight uh, solar neighborhood, uh, rises uh, with a contribution needed to explain this flat, uh, nearly flat part of the rotation curve. Okay, but this, well, this is assumed uh, in the outer part to show that both an NFW profile, uh, tradition of seed colder matter paradigm and ours, uh, can both uh, fit uh, very well the rotation curve in the outer 10 tens of kiloparsec. But uh, of course, if one wants to put better constraints to Sagittarius A star, one needs to analyze geodesics uh, and compare with the prediction of, uh, for example, Schwarzschild black hole. So we have done this for the first time in 2020 in this paper published uh, in Astrophysics where we have used um, all the data available at, at that time from BLT, or at least publicly available from BLT, K12, Gemini North, Gemini North, and Subaru. And uh, so we had the challenge that uh, to, to explain the multi-year accurate astrometric data of S2 star around Sagittarius A, including, of course, for the relativistic redshift, but also uh, the available data of the G2 orbit, and including for the G2 post pericenter passage, the deceleration, uh, which, uh, as a Rainer uh, remember, uh, recall us, uh, it was can be explained in the uh, black hole paradigm, though uh, invoking a drag force in an accretion uh, with, with some specific physics of accretion. Okay, so uh, the S2. So these gray dots are all the data we recollected uh, in 2020. And uh, we compare the models by solving or calculating the geodesic equations of a test particle in the gravitational field first of a Schwarzschild black hole of 407 10 to 6 solar masses, which is the produced the best fit to this uh, position in the sky of the particles, right ascension and declination of 3.3 roughly average chi square, while our uh, while there is a uh, best fit in the, uh, a good fit in the in dark matter fermion core. In this case, and a core mass of the fermion of uh, 3.5 to 6, uh, reaching a statistically prefer slightly preferred uh, chi square for this fitting. So though uh, very similar, but uh, slightly preferred. So both models are to S2 uh, at least as the data collected until the last year can, can be fit uh, very well uh, with the same statistical, nearly same statistical uh, accuracy. And then we move to the uh, line of sight radial velocity, or sometimes called the Z uh, redshift of uh, S2 around Sagittarius A. And uh, we can see as well that both models can fit uh, very well this data with a similar uh, chi squares, as I will show later in the table. But uh, I want to stress that uh, the important uh, point that both models can, well, of course, the black hole uh, has been shown very nicely to, for the first time, uh, show the relativistic uh, excess of this line of sight radial velocity. And in the dash is Newtonian, so we cannot be clearly explained only by Newtonian gravity, but uh, general relativity can account for this 
uh, excess of uh, redshift, but uh, our model can uh, explain uh, uh, with the very similar accuracy uh, this data. Uh, uh, so our model can also account for the redshift of this two, but now let's move to G2, which is very interesting uh, case for our model, because uh, where we have proceeded similarly calculated geodesic equation of a test particle, in, again, in the gravitational field of a short supply core of 47726 solar masses, and in the fermion core with a 56 scale, and both models can reproduce uh, very well the position, uh, slightly different, uh, you can see here, than I will show in the table the numbers. Uh, these are uh, similar statistical uh, numbers, but the, the, the first key result here in our model was really surprised us when we uh, saw this result is that for the same particle mass that one reproduces to star and velocity, uh, fit the post space center passage, as you see here, this three point of G2 uh, that the, the in blue is the black hole only, with much better accuracy. You can see here they reduce chi squares. In the case of black hole, is 26, and in the case of RAR, is uh, is nearly one, and therefore uh, here is the residuals to show the clear difference. And this was uh, very intriguing because uh, the same dark matter concentration can explain the post space center passage without to invoke this uh, drug force, which uh, either if they, it works, uh, it needs to assume uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, not well understood uh, assumptions, for example, in order to explain uh, this. In, they, they had to, uh, in that paper, they had to assume that the G2 is a gas cloud. But as I said before, the gas cloud hypothesis is not uh, totally accepted or even quite tensioned because it should have been stripped off by the, by, by, by the pooling of the central object as shown in another works. And also the, the density, the environment density needed for these objects, either if you assume that it's a gas cloud, uh, has to be extrapolated and it's not clear uh, which is the physics there. But uh, just, just to, this is, I think, is the first key result of our model. And then we extended the, the phenomenology and include the 17 best result as stars, as you can see here, uh, up, to 20, at, at, um, up to late 2020, uh, we'll publish this uh, this year. And uh, again, we calculated the geodesic equation either in a Schwarzschild black hole uh, metric of this uh, mass, uh, sorry. And, um, and in the case of uh, dark matter fermion core, again of 56, sorry, yes. Uh, again, in the case of 56 kilo electron volt and showing that the average of the reduced chi square, including position in the sky and, and radial velocity, uh, line of sight. Uh, so the average of all the 17 along all the data is slightly preferred again, the, our model uh, of dark matter respect to the black hole or, or respect to the, at least the Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, well, this, is very this, was, uh, this result was published uh, this year in this uh, monthly notice. Uh, when we said that uh, this uh, 56 k of dark pinos not only can explain the galaxy rotation curve data and the G2 without any drag force, but on also the 17 best results as stars. Uh, and, and here, please let me, let me say that I will not show in this talk, but let me say that this is even more interesting if one considers that the, for the same particle mass, one can explain uh, with this kind of core halo profiles for different temperature parameters and the generacies, the, the rotation curves of dwarf galaxies, other spirals, elliptical galaxies, and even clusters. So, um, and this is, we believe it is very true in the solution, which are Einstein solutions in the spherical symmetry, to, to not only, the, the particle mass can not only explain for a large scale structure of the universe, but also relaxing halos. And, 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 and explain for a plethora, a huge plethora of, of galactic halos, including the Milky Way and including this uh, precision towards the center of the orbital motion. So uh, this is, uh, we believe, is, uh, we have to, are obliged to keep forward in this endeavor because um, 
uh, it seems to be quite, um, it cannot be that coincident that all these regimes uh, are in order with these uh, particle masses. And so, well, uh, well, here uh, I will end now, and this is the, the table of uh, all these stars with the reduced chi squares, but probably other colleague of our team can explain better the differences. And so let me conclude that uh, accounting for a quantum nature of the matter particles in the relaxation of halos, uh, sorry, uh, accounting for a matter particle in the relaxation of halos, which indeed are not uh, included in, in usual cosmological simulation with classical particles, can lead to novel core halo profiles uh, with a dense core of fermions surrounded by diluted halo that for 50 keV particle mass about, about both uh, either a black hole paradigm or a dense core, this kind of dense, dense core of fermion intermatter can both explain the precise astrometric data of S star clusters, including S2. And, uh, but in the dark matter paradigm, besides this cluster and the Milky Way rotation curve, they can also be in a unified way uh, explain the post center passage of D2 without the drop force. Of course, there are open questions, uh, which I think are very interesting to, to pursue and to discuss, which, is, which are um, how these fermionic cores affect the gas accretion in these such low luminosity environments as the surrounding of Sagittarius A, can it help, these models can help to resolve the paradox of use, which is a, a problem which I think Rainer mentioned very briefly, but uh, which tells us that uh, it is not expected that uh, these cluster stars, which are quite young, uh, are there because uh, the conditions, um, the, 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 the gas, when, when the pristine gas clouds will have to collapse to form these young stars. If they are in the context of environment, a black hole, it, it should have been possible to, to be formed. So maybe if you don't have a singularity, it may help. So this is an open question. And uh, finally, uh, given that the extended dark matter uh, mass, the, the, the surrounding this core, uh, if they can improve or not the orbit Session of S2 around Sagittarius A. Okay, uh, I will stop here and thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Carlos, for this uh, interesting presentation. Can we hear maybe someone uh, uh, have a comment also from uh, um, uh, Rueda or Kroot? Or uh, Becerra? Uh, Edward, you would like, I don't know, you would like to mention oh. about the, the fittings? The yes, uh, I want uh, uh, words not in that in the table you sent. Let me put the table. Yeah, the last time. It's, it's important not, is. If we consider a difference in the first decimal of the reduced q squared average, uh, then the RAD model fits a little better five star S2, S18, S19, S21, and S31. Uh, uh, while the black hole model only fits S2 better than the RAD model, and the other 11 star are equivalently fixed for both models. This is a important part for the, the, the uh, variable of the statistical relevance, the reduced square sign of the, in, in this study the, of the 17 stars, uh, the direct the model uh, is, uh, explain a, a little better or more star than the black hole model. Okay, thank you. Can I just make a, a comment? Yes, Jorge. Yes, uh, first of all, to thank you both. Thanks, uh, Professor Gensel and Carlos for this, uh, for these uh, very interesting talks. Um, Professor Gensel talk was very beautiful to see all the story, all the history and the story at the same time. 
of all these um, technological developments which uh, uh, are uh, helping us to understand uh, what is the, the, the nature of the of uh, of Sagittarius a star and um, there was uh, uh, I, I also in the talk of Carlos I also see that there was a there is a, a, a also in parallel another journey which is a theoretical journey in uh, which are a lot of concepts that came that came that that, that have been coming out bit by bit through decades which have uh, helped us to do to to formulate. Um, all this theory and uh, about the data, I will just just to, to to mention that actually we are not pushing at, at the moment. We don't need to push very much pressure on on pressure in the sense of the of attention to the case of G two, because um actually um the data which is of higher quality of all the rest of the S stars are well fit by your model. So it's not question of G two or not G two. This is just a, a comment that I would like to to mention. And about the new the new objects, this uh, S55 and these other stars, we are uh, looking very much forward to fit uh, to the fit of this uh, new data, which uh, I think, uh, um, in as Carlos showed, the compactness of the of the core is a function of the mass of the particle. So it will be very nice to see if this new data will just give us a, a, a um, different value of the mass of the fermion, which it would be maybe maybe a little bit higher. Than, uh, than 56 keV, maybe 58 keV, maybe 60 keV. Uh, and, uh, and the same for the new data, for the forthcoming data of the precession of S2, that we are looking very much forward to that, to, to see that always that would be also a, a key information for the, for the determination of the mass of the particle, the, the mass of the fermion. Okay, very, yes. very exciting, and I hope Reinhardt will transmit to us the data as soon as available to allow us to make this refinement. I think also, it, it already from the result we have, I think um, the solution must be very, very close to a Schwarzschild-like solution. Uh, and uh, I will consider, um, well, we can certainly do a perturbation analysis to show the, the effect of the spin, a net spin of a care solution in this system. But I think the constraints are very strong, but this is my personal opinion for the spinning object. Uh, okay, uh, 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 I think the time has come. Is uh, Reinhard, you have a comment? Yeah, it, 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 you allow me to make a, a few comments. Yes. I mean, Absolutely. obviously, uh, we we all agree that this um, exercise is, uh, you know, very important and valuable. I think I would fully agree with that. Um, we all agree, I think, uh, qualitatively, that whether or not a soft potential, let me call it a dark matter distribution, a soft potential, okay, as co as as compared to a to a to a black hole solution, uh, soft on the scales of, you know, a thousand or at least a few hundred gravitational radii, whether that's allowable or not. Obviously, that, that, is, that is without any doubt, can only be tested either through very close objects and alternatively through high precision measurements. Okay? Uh, because any deviation from, uh, you know, a one of R squared, if you like, yeah, classical potential would, would be seen in things like the Schwarzschild position, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I, I, I do point out that you've, you've chosen not to take into account Sag A star and the ISCO motions. Okay, I think whether or not that's fair, I leave that to you. I, I find that uh, you, you, at least you would have to think how you then explain the presence 
of emitting variants in the center of your uh, fermion dark matter core, right? I mean, that's the, the least you would have to do. They're there, okay? Yeah. They're, all, they're there with emotions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in your paper, as I understand it, oh, let me first say something about G2. I think, let's please, uh, I would ask you to remove G2 from the, from the discussion because uh, the data on it are far less good than the, the stars. Okay, that's just the object is a, is a, is a you know, we, we observe the object largely in, in, in line emission. <clears throat> and so the, the astrometry is not as good as, as, as we have it in the, in the, at the even in the, in the adaptive optics data. So, and by the way, we have now stars which cover the same outer, if you like, outer region in radius as G2. So if G2 shows, is important for your model because of the slowing down, then there's something wrong because the stars, which are in the same volume, don't show any slowing down, so to speak. If, if, you, if, you, if you fit for any of the other stars a, a, a mass model, you get the same mass as with S2. So, so that tells you right away that, okay, G2 is a, you know, I, I, Let's leave out the discussion whether or not there's gas. I mean, for me, it's clear. It's very, very clear that it was disrupted and it came back together. And the fact that uh, uh, it is actually compact again is exactly what you would expect if the density of the accretion flow is low. But anyhow, I would suggest leave out G2 out of the analysis. Instead, take other stars. Um, now, as I see it, the, the analysis you've done, you've based on uh, the pub published information. So that's that's the uh, adaptive optics data sets, presumably, and in particular, DOA now. Now, yeah. you, you, you do realize that what I showed today are data which astrometry-wise are 30 times better than, than what DOA all have. And that's a very, especially near Perry, because near Perry, if you take an eight meter telescope, your diffraction uh, resolution is only 50 milli arc seconds, while the star passes as close as 20 milli arc seconds uh, to Sag A star. Sag A star is, is, is emitting almost all of the time. So your, your centroid during Perry of the adaptive optics data sets uh, are being pulled. We, we can see this in our own data. And in fact, we, you have to throw them away, okay? Oh, yeah. So, so the, it's the, the, the critical thing is to use the astrometry of the, of the interferometry, which is that much better. And the fact that I told you today that we have a detection of the Schwarzschild precession to 20 sigma should tell you something, because that is in, in essence, a direct statement about the nearness of the potential to a point source. Uh, can I comment? Sure. Yes. So this data of more, more precise than Joe et al. is, is uh, publicly available now? Well, okay. We, uh, we have not done that. And uh, um, but it's, it's a question how soon we will do that. The reason okay. is interferometry is a very new technique, okay? And in 2018, uh, well, okay, the, the 2020 paper on the Schwarzschild position, for instance, we were still obviously then working on various uh, uh, details on systematic effects, and we still are. So... Mm -hmm. What I don't want, and we've decided that here, what I don't want is that we put out, uh, you know, publicly available data, and then you all interpret them without knowing uh, how much systematics there is. And then you make a theory about it. And then two years later, you, you know, we have to tell you, I'm sorry. Yeah. So yeah, 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 I know. For sure. I we, mean, we, the we same can wait is, for that. This, in fact, if you look through the Doedal paper, uh, Tuan Do also points out the danger of the systematics at that level. So I, I'm a little, I'm a little 
I would say, hesitant to throw these data on the market, so to speak. And more important, the question is, uh, well, one could talk about collaborations and so forth, perhaps, uh, to do this inside so that one has a control of the, of the, of the systematics. Effect. But in any case, you know, think about what that means that a potential uh, is such that a Schwarzschild position is measured to yeah. 20 sigma. For yeah. you. May, I, I, may, I, may, may I make a comment? Yeah, then I oh. will also make another comment. First, uh, oh, okay, I feel, I feel a, 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 a bit uh, puzzled with the, with the comment on the data because um, uh, first you ask us to use your better data, but data you uh, this is not public, so we, we cannot use that. So we cannot go over this cycle. So we can use what it is public. We can, we were the first to ask uh, to people of uh, gravity collaboration about that, and we were uh, the answer was no. You cannot use. The, there are no public data on that, uh, so we cannot do that. And when the data will be public, we will. I mean, it will be, it will be a pleasure to do that to use the data to, to confirm our predictions. But even if you compare the analysis with the data that is public and with data the gravity collaboration within a black hole uh, hypothesis, uh, and in the results of uh, the gravity collaboration, the results of the Do, Do et al are not very far away. So um, I think uh, that even what the data will public, I think that if the mass of the, of the of, it will come instead of 56, maybe it comes 55 or so. It will be not a big difference. I, this is this is my guess. But anyway, and about I think there is a confusion. Our model is not Newtonian. Our model is general relativistic, fully general relativistic. It's not even post-Newtonian, so it's full general relativistic geodesics. So um, when uh, Carlos uh, showed that actually we also see can see the deviations in the in the in the gravitational redshift, it is not effect of dark matter of or of a matter as such. It's the, it's the, because the because the gravitational field is general relativistic. So this is a clarification that I would like to, to say. And is the is the same for the precession, which is uh, uh, on which we are we are working and we are going to present something very soon. Yeah. So I would like to make one short comment about precession and this claim of 20 sigma. Oh, I don't know, Rainer, at least I have heard very recently a claim for the American team that a precession may not be prograde. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you heard about? Let's uh, uh, stick to the data and let's lead, lead to the uh, official uh, statement and publication. Okay. Thank you, Rainer. The, the, rumor, the rumor, especially uh, in this very delicate situation, I will leave the rumor out. I would uh, be, uh, we are ready to examine with them uh, the, the data and uh, with our theory. We are ready on that, it's no problem. But, uh, uh, but please, uh, let's not speak about rumor. We have some results, as soon as we will have the results about uh, the precession, we will publish but uh, not, uh, not rumor, please. And well, anyway, I think I have to, we have to close because I see some of the, our distinguished member of the International Organizing Committee, which are waiting for the conclusion. And thank you again, Reinhard. Thank you everyone for this uh, um, interesting, uh, and as, uh, the poet uh, of Pescara said in Latin, ad maiora, namely, <laughs> let's go to greater and greater results. And I think we are going in this direction. Okay, thank you so much to okay. all. Thank you. And uh, now I would like to ask, uh, uh, first of all, I see Rashid Sumyayev, I see Razmik Mirzoyan, I see Tzvi. Today, <laughs> Sabat, you, you, you make a special effort to be with us. And uh, thank you. And uh, I would like to ask, uh, uh, well, first of all, if you have some comment, but then uh, before that, I would like to go to, um, to some official statement uh, from Gregory about the proceedings and all that. 
and, uh, and express already now the incredible, uh, uh, enormous work that uh, they did, coordinated by Gregory and the secretaries and the technician. I am really surprised after seeing other meeting where so many problems are, 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 are the perfect development of all this MG16 and how exciting has been to use this technology of um, uh, uh, communication. I think it's really essential from now on to use that for scientific exchange, etc. Where, where are you, Gregory? Can you say a few words? Yes, thank you. Uh... Thank you. I uh, will uh, just uh, want to share, uh, share a few facts about this meeting. Uh, maybe if you allow me to show you a simple uh, diagram. Okay, this is a number of participants. So you know very well we have uh, more than 1,000, 1,100 participants actually at the meeting. So this is distribution with countries. Uh, you can see United States is usually dominate. Uh, but we have many participants from Europe, Italy, Germany, UK, uh, France, and so on. And we have, of course, uh, other continents, China, uh, Japan, Australia, uh, Russia, and uh, also Brazil, South America. Uh, so this is, of course, truly uh, international meeting, as you can see. Uh, so uh, a large number of talks were present at this meeting, more than 1,000 actually people spoke. Uh, more than 80 parallel sessions were organized by uh, more than 100 uh, chairpersons of these sessions, uh, nine plenary sessions, five round tables, and uh, including the last one, uh, the last two, uh, very interesting yesterday night and uh, today. And uh, we also would like, of course, to say that the proceedings traditionally published by World Scientific will be published also for this meeting. We'll change a little bit the uh, plan because uh, even last proceedings were electronic and including this one will be electronic as well. So we'll try to collect as fast as possible the papers from the participants and uh, we will start, we hopefully start accepting uh, papers already uh, from uh, end of next week. And uh, we'd like to fix the deadline as soon as possible, September 30. But anyway, we will publish all this on the website of the meeting and try to send everything in print by the, uh, by the end of the year. And of course, it gives me a particular pleasure to thank all the members of the local organizing committee who actually worked very hard on organizing this meeting. Uh, I'd like to say their names, Christina Adamo and Silvia Latore, and our administration staff at Ikranet, uh, Cinze and Di Nicolò and Elisabetta Natale, the secretaries for handling all the communications with so many participants, especially uh, we're seeing this very complex program of the meeting. Carlo Luciano Bianco for his great help in handling test meetings for Zoom. This is fully new to us, but uh, we did it actually, I think, very good. Besides being also chairperson of the parallel session, um, Gabriele Brandolini and Domenica De Silva La Silva is our heroes actually who supported all the technical side of the meeting and in particular very hard work uh, on the 30 parallel sessions we had simultaneously every day. Our special thanks goes to the team in China, uh, Yuan, uh, Yufei, uh, Yifei, uh, Ifukai and Daniela Gregoris, they all three uh, were actually, they made possible all the uh, sessions, first block sessions, which started otherwise too early in the morning in Europe. And I think that the meeting uh, went well essentially thanks to the spirit of collaboration and uh, mutual support uh, developed in our team. So we hope to, to go further with this spirit. Thank you all so much for participating. And I hope we meet finally uh, in person, hopefully in three years after 2024. Okay, Professor. Well, let me uh, add uh, all the thanks that uh, 
Gregory did, uh, of course, from my own side. Um, can, uh, uh, before I go uh, to uh, sum up, uh, let me ask uh, Rashid if he has uh, any comment. Uh, I don't know, this was very interesting conference, not only previous to lectures, but a lot of plenary, I attended a lot of plenary talks and many thanks also for, to, for uh, copies of the YouTube uh, stream because it's possible to return to check numbers in the most interesting talks. I'm very grateful for this. And I was participating in the work of uh, three, uh, but just uh, not as a speaker, but I was participating in the work of three parallel sessions and they went and were organized extremely well. I also believe the team um, that the local organizing committee and uh, Gregory Verishagin uh, made a really great job and it's very, very good. And I wish Rev said, <laughs> <laughs> there will be no pandemic, pandemic in the uh, 2024 and next, uh, next uh, Marcel Grossman conference will be as interesting as this one. And I think that online version is going really very, very well. Thank you for organizing this meeting. Thank you, Rashid. Razmik, you have any comment? I see you there. Uh, I will just uh, join what uh, uh, Rashid Alevich uh, told us. I enjoyed the conference very much. I think I learned a lot. I appreciated uh, very distinguished speakers talking about very, very interesting uh, scientific topics. I think it was uh, very well organized and the Zoom was working uh, in a fantastic way, in my impression. Of course, I immediately agree that uh, Grigory Vereshagin did a fantastic job. I experienced it uh, just because of my parallel session, but uh, many things uh, needed to be adjusted. So I, I, I think uh, it's, uh, this is a great conference. I would like to thank Remo for organizing this and then the entire organizing committee and um, all the distinguished speakers. So, but uh, I think uh, maybe unlike uh, you, I'm a little bit more optimistic about pandemic I do not think that it will take another three years. I hope very much that next year, starting next year, we can have face-to-face -face meetings already in quite safe conditions. And then I think we will resume our face-to-face uh, -face meetings, which, which has another quality, higher quality. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Razmik. Uh, and uh, Tsvi, you have any are you there? Can yes, you? yes, I'm here. I uh, would like, uh, I somehow do not manage to switch on my video. I'll try it in a second. Uh, Where are you? I just drive back home. It was a complicated Good. story. Uh, back home in my uh, study. Okay, <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, I would like to thank uh, again, uh, like uh, the previous speakers, the organizing committee. This was a fantastic job, and I was in particular admired the carefulness in which uh, the timetable was arranged so that people from all over the world could join. I, I noticed the, the shifting of the, the sessions from one continent to another continent was amazing. And it shows, uh, among other things, something that Remo has pushed uh, for many years to show how global is this uh, community and how international is the search for a new understanding of uh, this theory of relativity. And I was also extremely impressed by the scope of this meeting, the trench from details at the level of uh, modeling of ide new ideas about the entropy of the black hole on one hand to, uh, to relativistic astrophysics and presentation of uh, dramatic uh, almost results uh, from uh, various experiments uh, ranging from various observations. So um, uh, this was a fantastic meeting and uh, I want 
to thank again everybody involved, in particular Remo, but also Gregory, for this uh, amazing organizational effort. And uh, I share the hopes that uh, uh, looking forward to see all the participants in the next meeting on live in, uh, in, in the next Marcel Grossman. Thank you. Uh, but uh, um, uh, thank you, Sri. Uh, well, I will not be long, uh, but um, I, I personally enjoyed very much every moment, even this morning at six o'clock. And um, the important point is that we have all on tape, all on tape on YouTube. And we are going to try to keep the entire conference available to everyone or to organize all the presentation to be available electronically. Because I think this is a, a unique, the first time that this can happen. But at the same time, we have been extremely lucky. There has been, is changing relativistic astrophysics. The emphasis is changing. Uh, we have, uh, of course, the, the great new uh, instrument which are coming in vehemently. We have seen uh, the radio observatory in China. We have seen the beautiful presentation of the new mission from China, from Nanzang and his collaborator. We have seen, uh, of course, the number one the winning the award, the, the great mission organized by Rashid uh, in, uh, uh, and the Russian uh, and um, Max Planck extraterrestrial physics of the, of the great mission, uh, which is uh, now in the Lagrange point outside the moon. But all these make us think that the development are going to grow enormously. But there are things which have been evolving in real time. I think the, the Teva radiation is one of the great new message that we are opening a new, a, a new domain, um, not, not just a, a, a very essential. And, um, and the good development we have seen from the ground observation of TEV is really, uh, uh, and the latest result in the few recent hours from uh, China, the TEV radiation, is not only the data are interesting, there is new physics, there is completely new physics coming on. And the GRB, of course, have been the major vehicle which has allowed to understand new physics and even to identify in this 50th anniversary of my work with Johnny of introducing the black hole. After 50 years, we finally found the way to convince even Roy Kerr that this solution is not just a, beautiful and unique in mathematics, but is essential to explain the energy extraction, that energy which we introduced uh, when we were much younger with Dimitrios Christodoulou, the extractable energy. There are still mystery, even in that formula, even in that irreducible mass. But this open just uh, the new, a new frontier, a new frontier in which we are much, much stronger from observational point of view and conceptually ready to new, uh, to new analysis on new time scale and to the quantum. This is the greatest message, which I think has been new and carried out in this meeting. The fact that we are ready to see not only the classical general relativity, but in a classical background, quantum, quantized, quantized effect at the astrophysical level. 
This is the message I sent today, and uh, I just uh, have to have a caution. I have always been in, mat in, in some difficult time to use uh, the classical word of uh, um, Eugene Wigner. Uh, interesting uh, was the word that uh, the message that uh, uh, Wheeler told me find the secretary of Niels Bohr. There was a message, interesting, equal, wrong. Well, Eugene uh, 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 amplify this message, very politely, always, very interesting, if true, equal, totally wrong. Uh, I have kept many times this attitude of using both words, interesting and very interesting, in some cases very interesting if true. But I would like to make sure that people consider also uh, the necessity of being accurate in, the, in, in, in creating good data. Because if the data are not good, we have to apply uh, uh, the famous word of Pauli. This paper is not even wrong because if the data are no good, it's, it's not even possible to establish if a paper is right or wrong. Therefore, please make an effort to implement good data analysis and let's move forward. And I think relativistic astrophysics will keep going as one of the most successful area of human knowledge. And we are understanding a lot, thanks to all our friends. And to all, not only friends, but thanks also to all scientists on the world. Thank you. Okay. Bye to everybody. It seems that this is a real end. Ciao. Ciao. I'm writing the letter to the ambassador today. Okay. I'm for Goodbye Thank to you. everyone. This was a great meeting. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Gerard, you are there. You arrive a little late. Gerard. Gerard. Where is he? <laughs> Uh, pu puoi collegare con Gerard? Allo? Allo? Can you connect Gerard? Okay. Too late.